Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here today. As we start to make the connect, oh, sorry, my apologies. <laughs> Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for being here today and joining us virtually for those of you who are out there for today's very exciting event, Kepler at 450, an interdisciplinary celebration. As you may know, the special collection of Calvin Smith Library recently acquired a valuable 1621 edition of Johannes Kepler's Mysterium Cosmographicum, or Cosmographic Mystery, that was written nearly 400 years ago. As his major astronomical work, Mysterium Cosmographicum describes Kepler's model of the solar system, which you will hear more about later today, and is seen by many as a crucial step in modernizing the existing theories of astronomy. Today, as we recognize the 25th anniversary of the Calvin Smith Library, we gather to celebrate this amazing acquisition and also the larger, lasting legacy of Kepler's work. Johannes Kepler's work serves as a remarkable example of what it means to take an interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary approach to learning, educating, and advancing the world around us. His work straddled the boundaries of astronomy, physics, music, politics, theology, and many other fields. To honor his prominent legacy over the course of yesterday and today, we have the opportunity to truly celebrate the interdisciplinary achievements of Case Western Reserve University. Soon, you will hear from faculty members in the arts, sciences, and humanities. Individually, each speaker will provide insights about Kepler's work from the perspective of their discipline and their expertise. Taken together, these discussions will show the true impact of Kepler's work hundreds of years later. To provide background and understanding, William Claspey from Calvin Smith Library's special collection will share more information about the acquisition of this work, sharing how this special piece made its way to Case Western Reserve. Then Aviva Rothman, assistant professor of history, will take us through a brief history of Kepler's Mysterium Cosmographicum to lay the groundwork for the rest of today's discussions. As we start to make the connection between Kepler's work and music, Bruce Dickey, Professor Emeritus from Basel School Cantorum, who will also perform later this evening, and I'm very excited about this, will explore music and the cosmology of Johannes Kepler in both theory and practice. And Jess Jesse Berzovsky, Associate Professor of Physics, will explain the connection between modern cosmology and musical harmony. During the final sessions of the day, Chris Hoffey, Associate Professor of Philosophy, Stacy McGill, Professor and Chair of Astronomy, and Harsh Mather, Professor of Physics, will take us through the philosophical problems presented by these discoveries, the importance of intellectual honesty in science, and the connection between quantum mechanics and the solar system today. This is an impressive lineup of experts in their given fields, and I am honored to have the opportunity to graze the surface of all of the critical topics that will be covered today. I hope that you will all sit back and enjoy both this beautiful facility that we have here at the Calvin Smith Library and the exchange of ideas that will be inspired by deep educational conversations to come. Today's celebration will close with a performance from world-renowned cornetist and director of the Concerto Palatino, Bruce Dickey, at the newly renovated Maltz Performing Arts Center this evening. And if you have not seen this facility, I hope that you will see it soon. It is absolutely stunning. Dickey will perform Nature's Secret Whisperings alongside the Case Western Reserve Collegium Early Music Singers, Baroque vocal ensembles, and the Baroque chamber ensembles. And I hope that you can all join us for that. Again, thank you all for being here today. I look forward to the rest of the day and hope that each of you take full advantage of the insightful conversations that are to come. Thank you so much.
Thank you, Dean Ward. My name is William Claspey, and I'm the head of Special Collections and Archives here uh, at Case Western Reserve University's Kelvin Smith Library. As today's first speaker, and as one of the co-coordinators of this event, uh, I welcome you to KSL and to our conference, uh, to those of you here at the library, um, and to those of you participating via our live stream. Uh, I'd like to start by sharing a few notes on logistics for today's event. Uh, you heard a rundown of some of the, the speakers uh, that will be, all of the speakers who will be talking today. Um, each speaker will talk for approximately 20 minutes, um, and there will be 10 minutes allowed for uh, questions and comments. For those of you on the live stream, uh, please feel free to ask any questions or, or contribute any comments that you might have using the chat feature on the live stream page, and we will relay your question to the speaker. You'll see on the conference program that we have two speakers this morning, followed by a short break, uh, then two more speakers before we break for lunch. Following lunch, we'll reconvene for the final three speakers, followed by a panel discussion uh, with all of the speakers. During the breaks and before we reconvene after lunch, um, our library's copy of Mysterium Cosmographicum will be on display uh, for you to see if you're attending in person. Uh, we didn't bring a birthday cake for Kepler on his 450th birthday, but we do have a pretty good book here to share with you. Um, and uh, as Dean Ward reminded us all of the, uh, the concert tonight at the Maltz Center for Performing Arts, uh, featuring guest artist Bruce Dickey, um, Bruce will also be speaking this morning. Um, and uh, this is really not a, a concert not to be missed. Um, and if you're in Cleveland, you, of course, can attend in person. It will also be streamed um, on the Maltz's live stream page. Um, I'll also point out that we have members of the Music Department's Historical Performance Practice Program uh, on hand today at the back of the room. Um, and uh, they have examples of Renaissance musical instruments, which they're excited to show you during our breaks today. Uh, please do visit them to learn more about these instruments uh, and the wonderful performers uh, that we have here on campus. Finally, on behalf of myself and co-coordinators Aviva Rothman from the History Department and Julie Andrzejewski of the Music Department, uh, we would like to extend our warmest thanks to our sponsors for making this event possible. Uh, the Kelvin Smith Library, the Baker Nord Center for the Humanities, and from the College of Arts and Sciences, the Department of Music and the Department of History. <laughs> So why does a librarian go first? Um, I hope to give you some context about two things. Why our library came to own a copy of this 400-year-old book, and why we thought it would be a good idea to hold an event like this. I'll also spend some time exploring how a book like this was produced 400 years ago, not necessarily how Kepler came to write the book. I'll leave that to uh, some of the other scholars on today's program. Uh, but more mechanically, how, how was the physical item of the book produced? And why is it important for us to understand how it was produced and to understand the life this copy of the book has led for the past 400 years? Exploring these questions brings me great satisfaction, and it allows me to spend the next few minutes showing you how I might use a book like this in a classroom setting. So why Kepler at 450? Uh, Johannes Kepler makes something of a perfect topic for a group of people from a wide range uh, of fields to discuss. Very briefly, he was a school teacher, a mathematician, an astrologer, an astronomer who was interested in optics, geometry, theology, music, politics, many other things as well. His published works make him a central figure of the scientific revolution of the 17th century. These aspects of the great scientist make him just the kind of guy who would fit in here at Case Western Reserve University. Uh, students here at CWRU have a reputation for earning a minor degree in one or more field of study that may or may not relate to their major field of study. And this describes Kepler perfectly, so he would really fit in here. Also, CWRU has a long history of the study of all of these fields, uh, and for decades now has supported a program in the history of science and technology. 
uh, and the Kelvin Smith Library and Special Collections has been an active supporter uh, of this academic pursuit. In 2016, uh, the library purchased a copy of, lost my slide here. I'm going to keep talking about Copernicus here for a second. <laughs> Thanks, Tim. <clears throat> In 2016, the library purchased a copy of Nicholas Copernicus's De Revolutionibus, the mid-16th century cornerstone of science, which brought the concept of heliocentrism to modern thought. And there you see a, the, uh, an image of the title page of Copernicus, Copernicus's book. Uh, there. So that was in 2016. Uh, just a few years later, Aviva Rothman joined the faculty here at the university. Uh, and Rothman is an authority on Kepler, so we at the library began working with her uh, to, bring our, to build our collection of his works at our library. So when this copy of the second edition of Kepler's Mysterium Cosmographicum appeared on the market in early 2020, we jumped at the chance to add it to our collection. Since the book was published in 1621, after it arrived, I sort of half-jokingly suggested that perhaps we could throw a birthday party for it. Um, and uh, before I knew it, uh, Aviva had a plan outlined for uh, what has become today's event, uh, also connecting to the fact that it's also the 450th anniversary of Kepler's birth. Double birthday party. So I want to talk a little bit about production of books, the production of books circa 1600. And this is how I teach classes that come to our reading room here at Special Collections. Their faculty teach them the importance of the work, where it fits within the scope of their class. And often, as in the case with this book, it's written in Latin, which many students, and even a few librarians, aren't able to read. So I focus on the, the material item, what went into the production of the book, the labor, the labor involved in making the paper, in making the type, in the printing of the book, and in the afterlife of the thing of the book, of this copy. And that's what I'll do for you a little bit this morning. Um, in the early 1590s, Kepler is a teacher of mathematics, and he contacts his former professor, Michael Maestlin, uh, who you can see on the slide here at the center, uh, who is at the University of Tübingen. And he says that he has formed some ideas and he sends him a draft of his book. Maestlin immediately sees that Kepler's ideas are totally new and the two of them petition the university for permission to publish, um, which is a long and drawn out affair. Uh, but they, they get permission to publish and the printer, who is Grippenbach of Tübingen, he agrees to print the book but only if Kepler agrees to pay for 200 copies of the book himself at the, at the price of 10 kreutzer each, or about 34 guilders total. Now, this demand may sound familiar to academics in the humanities, <laughs> who even today have to come up with a subvention in order to have their book published oftentimes. And to put the amount into context, at the time, Kepler was earning about 200 guilders per year. So it's a couple of months' salary um, in order to, to get his book printed. Eventually, he and Maislin raise the money, and the book is printed. How many more than 200 copies were printed? The record isn't really clear, um, but probably not a lot more. Um, this is, after all, a, a reasonably unknown scientist and his first book. Kepler did receive 30 guilders from the Duke of Württemberg, for dedicating the large plate in the book to him. And you can see both the, de the dedication here and a painting of the Duke uh, here on the slide. So much as we are in the Kelvin Smith Library, in the Friedman Center, um, uh, patronage was a thing. Having this many copies at hand meant that, Kep meant that Kepler and Maislin could send them all across Europe to other scientists, some of whom they knew and some of whom they did not know. Um, and this included both Tycho Brahe and Galileo Galilei, uh, both of whom uh, Kepler went on uh, later in life to have somewhat complicated relationships with. <clears throat> so in 
Some 25 years later, the first edition had long been out of print. Kepler's many copies all distributed, presumably, and so he was encouraged by friends and scholars to produce a second edition of the book. Um, although he held to the main theses of his first book, many details had been expanded upon or a few thrown out uh, as he continued to study and publish during the intervening years. Theoretically, then, a whole new book would have to be written. Instead, Kepler had the printer simply reset the original text in type, and he added notes to each chapter, some voluminous, um, in which he could explicate and clarify specific points. What we have with the second edition, then, uh, is a unique view of the mature scientist reflecting back on his first work, his little book, as he called it, and responding to his younger self. While Kepler was not required to pay for the printing this time, uh, we do know that he received 300 guilders uh, for dedicating the publication to the Styrian Estates, which is where he was working, and his income at, at the time was approximately 3,000 guilders per year. So by 1621, Kepler was very well known, even famous scientist, and so the book could be produced a bit more lavishly as well. Um, and the printer and the book dealer at this time for this edition are Kempfer and Tom, Tompach of Frankfurt. So one physical difference between the first and second editions of the book has to do with the format in which they were printed. And here we see on this slide um, a representation of a single sheet of paper on which the pages, uh, on which pages of, from the first edition are printed. Uh, the, the format in this case is quarto. That gives me a chance. I have, a, I have a very small facsimile of the quarto sheet here. <clears throat> in the quarto format, the printer sets the type of four pages to be printed on each side of the sheet of paper, laid out as we see here in the slide. Uh, once both sides of the, of the sheet of paper have been printed, the sheet is folded once and then twice, and the result is four leaves or eight pages of text. Books printed in this quarto format tend to have a more square re rather than rectangular shape to them. And it was a format fairly commonly used during the time period. It was an effective way to produce a reasonable size, not too large, not too small book, uh, with fairly efficient use of paper. And paper at the time uh, that was used to print books was the single most expensive commodity in the production of books. So it was a good, efficient way um, to, to print a book. Uh, the second edition, however, was reset in the folio format. What we see here is a representation of how the printer would lay out the type for one sheet of paper, again, uh, with two pages of text per side. And in this case, the printer would lay out eight pages of text to take up two sheets of paper. Um, and those of you here today um, will find facsimiles of these sheets of paper um, on your chair. I thought about putting them under your chair so we could have an Oprah moment, um, but I put them on the chair. So anyhow, um, you have a facsimile of those two sheets of paper um, that the printer would, would lay out uh, uh, eight pages uh, of text on. Uh, what we see here is the start of the B gathering. So each gathering of pages was given a, a letter. Um, and what we have here is the B gathering. You'll see the capital letter B just below that diagram on page nine. That's what that indicates. Um, so that first sheet of paper includes the first two and the last two pages of that eight page gathering. The middle four pages would be printed on a second sheet of paper. Each of these sheets would be simply folded in half, as some of you have already done, but the rest of you can uh, try out now. This is like the easiest folding uh, exercise ever invented. Um, uh, so each of them are folded simply in half. Um, and uh, first, if you take the sheet that has B2 at the bottom, fold it so that B2 is facing out. Then take the sheet has, that has the diagram and the letter B at the bottom and fold that the same way so that the B and the fancy diagram is, is facing out. 
Now you'll insert the B2 pages inside the B pages, and you'll have your own copy of pages 9 through 16 of the second edition to take home with you. You'll see in there uh, a section of the author's notes in, as well, uh, so you can get a sense of the, the notes that Kepler made on, on the original text to practice your Latin. Books printed in this folio format are generally taller and more rectangular, and obviously use more sheets of paper for a given number of pages, and thus are often thought of as more luxurious. We've all heard of Shakespeare's first folio, for example. How about the production and reproduction of the plates that are in the book? There are several plates, um, and the one on the, on the slide now, and I have a reproduction of it as well up at the front. Uh, uh, so I want to talk about how the, the plate was produced and how it was then reproduced. Uh, for the first edition, the Tübingen artist Liebfried was hired to etch the plate representing Kepler's theory regarding planetary distances, which he, pa which he based on the five platonic solids nested inside each other. It sounds pretty complicated, and, and I'm hoping Professor Rothman will help us with that concept a little bit later. Um, but the etching of the plate is rather complicated as well. So the image that we have in front of us and the text would have been etched onto a metal plate in reverse, and that metal plate then would be used to print the image on a sheet of paper. And here on the slide, we have two images of this famous plate. On the left is an image of the plate from the first edition of 1596-1597, um, and this is from the copy located in, in Dresden, Germany at the State Library of Saxony. Um, and on the right is an image of the plate from our copy of the second edition. So what are the visible differences between the two, and what do these differences tell us about how the plate was produced? Um, and in a class setting, I, this, is, this would be when I would um, awkward, awkwardly pause while the students try to think of something to say to me. Um, but I'll just point out some of the differences. Some of them are pretty obvious, even from the back there. Um, the most obvious is that they're mirror images of each other. Um, but some other differences that you might notice, uh, one is uh, the apparent direction of the source of light uh, so due to the shading, um, you can see that on this one, the light seems to be coming from, from, from that direction. On the other side, it appears to be coming from the other side. Um, if, if you can make out on the slide here that the paper seems to be a different color, there's different titling at the top. There's different words. They're different size. There's some smaller, maybe harder to make out differences when looking at this on a screen. Um, there's different instructions to the binder as to where to put this plate. Uh, there's differences in how the artist and the printer are credited. And there's differences in the style of cross-hatching that indicate the shaded areas as well. And even fainter to see, but maybe you can make it out, you can see some shadows of where um, the, the uh, paper has been folded so that the plate will fit inside the book. Um, and you'll see that those folds occur in different places um, on these two plates. Um, and that's to do with the difference between the quarto format and the folio format. So the one from the first edition had to be folded to fit inside the quarto. Um, the one from the 1621 edition is folded to fit inside the folio. But the mirror image and the difference in shading and writing tell us how this engraving was remade for the second edition. So the original plate, the original metal plate that was used to, to create the, uh, the etching was probably long gone after 25 years. So an engraver used the paper copy to trace out the shape of the, of, of the form um, on a new metal plate. Um, and then he engraved the writing and the shading um, to his own patterns and his own styles. Um, you'll also see that on the later edition, uh, the Duke of Württemberg's uh, dedication is left off. That 30 guilders is long spent. <laughs> I'd also like to talk about some specific traits of our library's copy of the second edition. As for a bibliographer like myself, looking at specific copies can tell us much about how this book was used. Um, this, the slide that we have here shows the outside of the book, um, the binding of the book, uh, which is very simple indeed. 
Um, it's perhaps not, it perhaps does not date to 1621, uh, but it's certainly as it might have been issued. So it's, it looks very much like it would have looked uh, if you bought this book from, a books, from the bookseller in Frankfurt in 1621. It's, and it's surprising to me um, that a, fi a fancy binding hasn't been added over the past 400 years. For, for a book uh, of this stature, typically a, an owner would put a very nice uh, full Morocco binding on it, um, but our copy does not have that, uh, which is actually, to me, kind of nice. I want to talk about the ownership of this copy of the book, uh, and that's the, the study of provenance. Provenance is when we look at the record of ownership of a specific item. And we have at least some ability to know about previous owners of this copy. There are no markings in the book showing any ownership indications uh, earlier than 1920, uh, so when the book was merely 300 years old. Um, there are pencil markings on the front flyleaf, which you can see on the slide here. Um, and the, these pencil markings give us two names and a date. We can see the names of Dr. Fichtner and Dr. Meltzer. And below it, Mexico City, 4th of August, 1920. Um, I did a little bit of research on these doctors and was able to find this guidebook um, on the other side of the, of the slide there. Um, a guidebook of Germany, a German guidebook of Mexico, excuse me, uh, published in 1921. Um, and this section of the guidebook on page 92 um, listed German doctors working in Mexico City um, at the time. And we can see both Dr. Fichtner's and Dr. Meltzer's names. So these were apparently two physicians working uh, in Mexico City around 1920. Now, why the book was there and why these uh, two doctors had this book um, is unknown, uh, but leaves a nice uh, detective story for someone to follow up on uh, in the future. Uh, the dealer from whom we uh, acquired the book did tell me that he acquired the book at an auction in Mexico some years ago. Um, so it sort of fits, uh, but it is still rather curious. Otherwise, the book has no marginalia, so no markings inside the book um, uh, other than uh, these pencil markings um, on, the, on, on the front flyleaf. Finally, uh, once the book arrived here at the Kelvin Smith Library, uh, we knew that we wanted to digitize this book, and that we have done. Uh, the book has been fully digitized, um, and it is available to look at online through our institutional repository digital case which has the very easy to remember URL, digital.case.edu. So if you want to see the full book, you can see it online there. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'd be happy to hear your comments and respond to your questions. <laughs> Hi, Rachel. I wonder if you could use the microphone just for the live stream. Thank you. Sure. Um, so Rachel asked, um, what happens to the paper and the ink over the centuries? Um, and it's actually a fortunate thing um, for the survival of uh, books like this that uh, the paper produced at the time is a very sturdy uh, substance. Um, it's typically made from linen rag uh, rather than wood pulp uh, the way that modern paper is made. Um, and so it's very sturdy and sort of naturally acid free. So it tends to last very, very well. Um, it does age over time, and different types of paper age in different ways. Um, the paper in this copy is in pretty good shape. There is some um, 
uh, age spots uh, like some of us get at a certain age. Um, it does have some age spots, but it is relatively sturdy. Um, as many books from 400 years ago are. I like to point out to students who come to the reading room um, that a book that's 400 years ago, I'm much more comfortable in, in many cases having students handle books from 400 years ago than I am having them handle books from 100 years ago. Um, so books from the late 19th and early 20th century are often much more fragile. Um, the ink you asked about as well, uh, printer's ink is, is quite stable and usually not much happens to it. Um, writing ink was a little bit different, um, and oftentimes if somebody has written in a book, um, sometimes that ink um, can burn through a page because of the acidity um, from the materials that were used to make the ink. Um, not the case in this book, as I said, uh, there isn't any writing in this book, um, but that is something that we see from time to time. Thank yeah, thanks, Rachel. Chris, if you could use the microphone, please. I was a little bit surprised by the plainness of the original binding. As you say, by the second edition, Kepler was more well known. I, you know, I'm used to modern splash blurbs and things like that, but to have it completely plain like that, was that common even for big authors? It, it, it was common. Uh, so uh, there was, um, in the production of books, there were um, the, the creation of the paper and the printed object um, was separated from the trade of the binding of that object. So oftentimes, the bookseller would sell it, just as you see here, in a very plain, they, they call it in wrappers. Um, and sometimes it was even plainer than this. Um, typically, what an owner would do then is pop next door to the bookbinder, who was right next, next door to the bookseller, um, and ask him to put that book into a uh, leather binding to match the rest of his books at home or, or what have you, um, or uh, you know, even, a, even a slightly sturdier cloth binding. Um, so yeah, it, but it is surprising that um, typically, um, even if the first owner hadn't done that, oftentimes somebody would have been very proud to own this book 200 years later and put it in a leather binding, but this one hasn't had that. Thanks. Yep. Hi, Chris. Hi, thank you. Um, who would have uh, been purchasing in a run of 200 copies? Is this going to institutions or individuals and <clears throat> what kind and so on? Thanks. Uh -huh. So the, as I said, the first edition was a fairly small print run. Um, and it, from what I can tell, um, Kepler o ended up owning most of them. Um, and so he, he honestly did just send them around. Um, the copy that ended up uh, with Galileo, um, uh, Galileo wasn't particularly well known, I don't think, in 1596, 1597. Um, so um, they didn't know each other. Um, but he did read it. It wasn't sent specifically to him, but there was a copy floating around Padua. Um, uh, Galileo reads it and immediately writes off a letter uh, to Kepler uh, to tell him uh, that he really thought highly of, his, of the book. Um, so they were literally just distributed by uh, Kepler and his friends. The second edition, um, I didn't run across any uh, easily found information about the print run. I'm guessing it would have been bigger. Again, Kepler is famous at this point, um, and so more copies would have been produced. Um, the Kampak and, and the, the printer and the book dealer in Frankfurt that are listed on the title page um, are kind of big deals. So um, they would make sure that um, those copies would, would be sold um, as well. Phil. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure how you could know this, but do you have any idea how, how many copies were marked up by readers? And that's typically the kind of um, work that's taken up by uh, scholars who do censuses of copies. Um, sort of most famously in this field, uh, Owen Gingerich of Harvard did the census of, of Copernicus's, uh, both the first and second edition. And in that bibliography, he lists marginalia, any differences, binding differences, all of those kinds of things. Um, to, to my knowledge, a bibliography uh, of that sort has not been done on this book, um, but that's the kind of work that typically would be done um, when somebody's looking at multiple copies over time. And what kind of testing would be done to determine that it's not a fraudulent copy? 
That's a great question, dear to the heart of many rare book librarians. Um, usually, um, they're not, well, they're, they're never invasive tests, uh, for one thing. Um, but there are, one thing that uh, a bibliographer's work allows us to do is to identify um, small differences between copies. Um, so in a bibliography of Kepler's work, uh, we may know that um, the third page of the B signature uh, didn't get a signature mark. Um, and so if I look at all of the copies and I see one that does, that sort of indicates that something might be wrong or that a word is spelled incorrectly, they caught it through the print run and corrected it. You know, those kinds of differences are the things that um, bibliographers look for and it makes it harder to uh, produce fraudulent copies. On certain books that are exceptionally valuable, people try it anyways. Um, so, and that's been known to be, to be done, obviously. Um, uh, and so what, 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 what we do as rare book librarians is our due diligence to, to look for all of those, uh, those clues. Thank you very much. And our next speaker um, is Aviva Rothman from the, the history department. Thanks uh, to everybody for being here. Um, thank you to Julie Andrzejewski and to Bill Klaspi, my co-organizers. Um, I want to say first that I'm really so uh, privileged to be here um, at an institution where people um, from across the disciplines, from the sciences and the humanities and the arts, are so willing and eager to engage in this kind of conversation across disciplinary boundaries. And it seems to me very appropriate uh, that this is happening on a campus where the sciences are on one side and the arts and humanities are on the other side, but we join across Euclid Avenue, literally geometry, right? Uh, this is a very Keplerian thing, I think. I think, um, and nicely symbolic. Uh, so we're here to celebrate Kepler's birth and the, the book, let me just move here, 1571 to 1630. Um, most of us know something about Kepler, just to remind you of what he's most famous for. I bring this <laughs> comic, right, where Kepler is uh, uh, teaching about elliptical orbits and nobody understands what he's saying. Now, um, as a literal representation of what happened, this is false. <laughs> These questions would not have been asked by his contemporaries. But as a um, metaphor for the fact that Kepler said a lot of things that would have seemed strange to his contemporaries, I think this is accurate um, in um, the fact that Kepler was a Copernican when most of his contemporaries um, still uh, adopted some form of geocentrism in the fact that Kepler argued that astronomy could only be understood if explained in the light of physical causes. This would have been a, a strange and controversial claim. Um, and um, in his sort of larger approach, in, the, in his uh, insistence ultimately that planets moved in ellipses, um, argu arguably a more uh, revolutionary uh, shift than the Copernican revolution itself, which was motivated in part by Copernicus' des desire to bring back the circle, um, which he felt Ptolemy had moved away from. So I wanted to just talk really briefly first about the ways in which Kepler's work transcends disciplinary boundaries, as we've noted. And to do that, I uh, just pulled some uh, some title pages from a lot of his books just to show you the range we're talking about here. First, the Mysterium Cosmographicum itself. Um, and it's worth noting, too, that uh, booksellers uh, had trouble figuring out what genre to place this book in. Um, Kepler complains about this sometimes he, when he, he sees it in the wrong place in the store. It's astronomical. It's cosmological. The word Mysterium would have had theological resonances um, to readers of the book. Uh, we have here the uh, new astronomy. The title also would have been strange to people. He calls it a new astronomy uh, based on physics uh, or a celestial physics, right? That, that phrase, celestial physics, would, would have been weird um, to people reading a book of astronomy. Uh, we have the harmony of the world, um, a book that combined lots of different disciplines into one, and I'll talk about that a little too. Uh, the Rudolphine Tables, uh, Kepler taking up the work of Tycho Brahe to publish uh, new and more accurate astronomical tables. Uh, his uh, optics, the optical part of astronomy. Um, and then the conversation that Kepler has uh, with Galileo's starry messenger, uh, which leads to a whole set of 
of books, um, including the Dioptrix, which is Kepler's um, optical uh, discussion, the discussions of how the telescope worked for people uh, to um, be able to understand what it was that Galileo had done. Uh, let's see, what else did I bring here? His discussion of the new star of 1604 and what it meant across disciplinary boundaries. Um, his, what do I have here? Uh, his chronological study of the true year of the birth of Christ, which he argued was different than um, had traditionally been supposed. Uh, his work on the, uh, what do I have here? The snowflake, um, the analysis of um, why snowflakes are shaped the way they are. Uh, his uh, textbook of Copernican astronomy, which is written in question and answer format and takes people over multiple volumes through uh, a new way of doing astronomy on the basis of both Copernicus's work and his own. Uh, this one, let's see, a little hard for me to see here. Uh, his, um, what do I have here? Ah. His um, Somnium, his uh, study of uh, his dream narrative of a voyage to the moon and of what it would look like um, for people on the moon to see the Earth. This is an argument for Copernicanism that involves um, flipping perspectives and jumping to somewhere new. Uh, what, do I've got, what do I have over here? Oh, his Confession of Faith from 1623, um, where he um, explains some of the reasons that led to um, his earlier excommunication from the Lutheran Church. His uh, discussion of the stereometry of wine barrels. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, his third man in the middle, which is an astrological book where he um, positions himself between people who want to retain all of the traditional astrological wisdom and people who want to chuck it entirely. Uh, horoscopes, many of which he made for political patrons and others. And finally, lots and lots of letters, um, which give us insight um, into the relationships he had with other people and the ways in which he slowly developed his own ideas. So. Mysterium Cosmographic, and let's come back to this book. I want to just sort of lay out where he's coming from and what it is he argued so we get a sense of what we're celebrating here. Um, Kepler begins uh, the uh, thinking about the Mysterium Cosmographicum when he is a 25-year-old school teacher in Graz. Um, he's a Copernican already, um, so he believes that the sun is at the center of the cosmos and not the Earth. There are now six planets instead of the traditional seven, right? We swap the um, Earth for the sun and the moon. Um, and his question is, why are there six planets? Why only six? And why are they spaced at the distances that they are? Copernicus does not have a reason for this. And Kepler is firmly invested in the idea that there has to be a reason for everything. So he's thinking through these questions. Um, and he describes the moment where uh, the, an idea occurred to him. He's teaching his students, writing at the blackboard. Um, and he's talking about the great conjunctions of Jupiter and Saturn. So the moments where they are um, aligned uh, you know, on the zodiac, um, these happen every 20 years and they're about 120 degrees apart. So he's drawing on the board a map of these conjunctions. And if you, if you think that the outer circle is the zodiac, um, what he's doing is he's drawing a lot straight lines from one conjunction to the other. And as he does this, he's drawing a set of slowly rotating equilateral triangles, which end up inscribing another circle inside of them. And that's what this image is. And he realizes, as he's doing this, that the two circles are basically the ratios of the orbits of Jupiter and Saturn. All right, so as he describes in the book, this is a sort of a frozen aha moment for him. He pauses at the board. He stops teaching. Uh, he gets caught up in his thoughts. And he figures this has to be important. It has to be important for him because geometry is not you know, coincidentally interesting. It is the language that the universe is written in. Um, this is how he puts it. Geometry, which before the origin of things was co-eternal with the divine mind and is God himself, for what could there be in God, which would not be God himself, supplied God with patterns for the creation of the world and passed over to man along with the image of God. So the idea here is that the cosmos is written with geometry, but so are human beings created along the lines of geometry. Their mind works geometrically. So this, for Kepler, is both proof that um, we can use um, geometry to figure things out and that we're onto the right things, right? Our minds, the universe, and God are all sort of written with the same archetype behind them. 
Um, Kepler is also confident that he can figure out the answer to this question, he tells us, um, because he thinks that the universe is not just written geometrically, it's written theologically and sacramentally. So what he says um, also in the Mysterium Cosmographicum at the very beginning is, I was made bold to attempt this, this is answering these questions, by the beautiful harmony that exists between the parts that are at rest, the sun, the fixed stars, and the intermediate space, and God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Since the parts that are at rest are disposed in this way, I did not doubt that the moving parts would also be harmonious. All right, so the argument here is that there's something about the Copernican cosmos to him that suggests the Trinity, right? Three parts that are dependent upon one another. Um, for Kepler, uh, theology points both to the Copernican cosmos and to geometry. And the question is, how can he bring those together to answer questions that Copernicus himself hasn't yet answered? Or, as he puts it in a note to the reader at the very beginning of the book, here are the big questions. Greetings, friendly reader. This book is going to address what kind of world this is, what reason and plan God had for creating it, whence God selected the numbers, what rule there is for so great a mass, what might bring about six circuits, which intervals fall between which spheres, why there is so great a gap between Jupiter and Mars, by no means in the first spheres. Pythagoras teaches all these things here to you with the five figures, right? So a big plan for the book right at the start. Um, and it didn't take him long to, to, to realize that if he had inscribe those two circles of those orbits using triangles, there might be a way to select some kind of geometrical figures that would let him figure out the answer to the question of the orbits. And from there, it wasn't a great leap to the five platonic solids, the sometimes called the Pythagorean solids, the perfect solids, um, perfect because they're all composed of uh, regular polygons of the same shape and size. Uh, Euclid had long ago shown that there could only be five of these, the tetrahedron, octahedron, cube, icosahedron, Hedron and dodecahedron. And each of these figures, um, what you can do is you can um, circumscribe a sphere around them and inscribe a sphere within them, right? Within them, where the um, sphere touches on the center of the each face of the polygon and around them where it touches on the vertex, um, in each of the, vert the vertices. Um, and so Kepler realized that if he did this, if he took those kinds of spheres and then nested them one inside the other, um, right, you would end up with exactly six. Right? So there, right away, you have an answer to the question, why six planets? Because there are only five platonic solids. And then the question is, just figuring out the order to line them up so that you get a match with the actual astronomical data. So he plays around with it. He has uh, both aesthetic concerns and you know, data-driven concerns. He knows what the data suggest. He's trying to figure out the differences between the platonic solids that might incline you toward using one rather than the other. Um, and he ends up with um, uh, an order ordering system based on the cubes. I have a, uh, based on the spheres, I have a picture here. Um, that's what you're seeing here too in the, in the frontispiece. You're seeing them um, all nested inside the other. Maybe you can see in the one on the right, the sun smiling at us from the very middle. It's happy that we figured out the answer. Um, you end up with a, um, a system that really closely matches the astronomical data. It's, it's pretty good. Uh, Kepler realizes right away, of course, that it's pretty good, but it's not perfect. He knows this. He's worried about this. He's worried that it's not perfect, um, both because he thinks it should be, right? If you've come upon the right answer, if the, if the model is right, and if there's something true and you know, geometric about it, you should get the right result. He's also worried that his readers will discount what he's come up with, because they will point to minor discrepancies in the data. So he writes to his professor, Michael Nestlin, and says, I'm really worried about um, you know, this lack of accuracy. I want to keep working on this, but I also want to publish my work. And Meslin writes back to him and reminds him about another student-teacher pair who had a similar conversation. Um, that pair was Copernicus and his student Redicus. Um, Redicus, according to Copernicus, was a little too focused on the trees at the expense of the forest. Redicus was also very interested in exactitude and data, and sometimes that led him to stop thinking about what big picture theories he might you know, draw on the basis of that data. And as Redicus recounts in one of his own letters, Copernicus said to him, 
sometimes you just have to run with it. Uh, you can't necessarily worry about you know, perfection um, in your fit. And Kepler actually prints that letter. He quotes it in the Mysterium Cosmographicum, offers it to the reader as sort of um, you know, a bolster to his own position, and then um, writes to them a little bit about Copernicus's own approach. And I brought that for you here. I'm going to you know, break a rule of presentations and throw up a lot of text for you right now. But I think it's a really interesting uh, moment in the book that's worth reflecting on. So here is Kepler on the lack of perfect accuracy between the astronomical data and his platonic solid theory. He says, and here he's talking about Copernicus, there are many things that Copernicus restored for us in the science of the motions, which had fallen into ruin, and our astronomy is purer than the memory of our fathers. But even so, if we examine the matter itself deeply, we will certainly be compelled to admit that we are almost as distant from that blessed and desired perfection as ancient astronomy is from that of today. The path on the way to the truth is long and circuitous. The ancients have shown it to us, and our ancestors advanced upon it, we move ahead and pause one, one step closer, but we have not yet reached the goal, right? So we're not perfect yet. Indeed, the diligent reader of Copernicus will find that Copernicus himself acted as a human being in accepting whatever sort of numbers fulfilled his needs to a certain extent and established his principles. He does not reject numbers from diverse operations that ought to fully agree, although they have discrepancies of some small amounts. He has no scruple in now and then disregarding or changing hours and time, quarters of degrees and angles and more. Occasionally, he even accepts discrepancies from the truth only because they point a finger slightly toward what he wants. He draws out from Ptolemy many things whole and untouched, though by his own admission they should have been corrected, and he builds up the foundations of the new astronomy afterwards on all this. And Kepler closes by saying this. Indeed, he would justly seem to incur criticism if he had not done it purposely, because he preferred to have an astronomy imperfect in certain ways, rather than to be without one entirely. For these sorts of difficulties may occur while the stars hasten along. To overcome them and to aspire without impediment to constitute a science with minimal fault, as Copernicus dared, is the mark of a courageous man, while a lazy man would sidestep it and a timid one would give up hope and abandon the whole responsibility. So I show you this for a few reasons. One, I think it really nicely lets us involve ourselves in a historic conversation, right? A conversation between students and teachers, Redicus and Copernicus, Meslin and Kepler, a conversation that happens in letters and books across time, uh, one that you know, we still participate in, and a conversation that gets at a question that we still have when it comes to the pursuit of science, right? When have you gotten it right enough? At what point can you tolerate imperfection? At what point can you not? I raise this also because this approach here um, contradicts perhaps Kepler's more famous approach, which I think some of our other uh, speakers are going to talk about, where um, what motivates him to break the circle is a discrepancy in the data, right? So we'll talk about that later, but I think this raises the question of when you take either approach, the approach of it's perfect enough and the approach of, no, I don't think it is, right? So that, that's a question, you know, maybe for thought later in the day as, as those speakers um, talk about his new astronomy. For now, um, I want to talk about the relationship between the Mysterium Cosmographicum and the harmony of the world, especially since this conference is roping together both the book and the musical work. Um, Kepler addresses this question at the beginning of the 1621 edition of the Mysterium Cosmographicum, um, and in particular addresses the question of why it is that he published a prodromus, literally a forerunner, that's the first word in the title of the Mysterium Cosmographicum, and never published an epidromus or a successor you know, um, or so it seems. And what he says is, well, I kind of did. All right, here's what he says. The reader will be able to have my remaining astronomical works, but especially the books of the harmonies, as the genuine and particular successors of this little book, because I hastened along the same path in both. Right, he, he says, first of all, every other book I wrote was inspired by this book, and the harmonies especially are this book's successor. That book is the epidromus. That which was then, in the original edition, somewhat inaccessible is now very well trodden, and that which was then brief and hadn't yet reached the target is continued in the harmonies, and the chariot is now approaching the goal. The forerunner, the prodromus, was like the first voyage of Amerigo Vespucci. The successors are like today's annual voyages to America. 
So first, just to note, you know, one way in which this book, the Mysterium Cosmographicum, affected his later work, which you know Bill already alluded to, is that it started conversations that would be important to his later work. Right when Galileo gets a copy of the Mysterium Cosmographicum and writes to Kepler saying, "I'm a Copernican too," uh, that conversation pauses in 1597, but will pick up again in 1610 with the telescopic discoveries and will be really important to both of the, their later work. Um, Kepler himself also sends a copy of the book to Tycho Brahe, who writes back to him and says, I really like the book, but I think the data you're working with is not good enough to make the claims you're making. Come see mine, right? Tycho Brahe, the famous quirky Danish nobleman who's working on an island, you know, bequeathed to him by the King of Denmark and putting together, you know, the best observations that anybody has seen, you know, to date. And Kepler is not sure about that invitation, but eventually, um, after he's expelled from Graz, he does take Tycho Brahe up on that offer. Tycho Brahe is by then in Prague, and um, this will start Kepler on the journey that will eventually lead to both the new astronomy and the Rudolphine tables. So in that sense, this book does lead to a lot of his future work. But um, for our purposes, the question is, what's the relationship between the theories of the Mysterium Cosmographicum and the theories of the harmony? So between the two, between the Mysterium Cosmographicum and the harmony of the world, Kepler had begun thinking about astronomy in much more physical terms. He had started thinking about the motions of the planets and their speeds and what force might cause that, and had posited that the sun was the motive force for the motions of the planets and had you know, shown that the planets are sometimes closer to the sun and sometimes farther away from the sun in their orbit and that when they're closer to the sun, they move faster and when they're farther away, they move more slowly. So, by the time we get to the harmony of the world, Kepler has moved from questions of distance to questions of speed. Um, and to answer those questions, he's moved from geometry to something different, to music, which we should remember is not a very huge leap if you think about the fact that geometry and music are two of the four pillars of the medieval quadrivium, right? the other two being astronomy and arithmetic, which are the foundations of a medieval liberal arts education. Right? So these two are connected. Um, but what Kepler uh, ends up saying in the harmony of the world is the theory of the platonic solids is still basically true. It still explains a lot of what we see in the structuring of the cosmos. But what we also need to explain are the differences in planetary speeds. And what he argues is if you take the minimum speed of every planet and the maximum speed of every planet, and I think maybe some of our others will speak about this more, other speakers will talk about this more, you get a harmonic ratio between every planet's minimum speed and maximum speed. Um, so what every planet is doing is it's moving, um, as it's moving through its orbit, it's sounding out a series of notes, it's playing a song in different pitches. Um, because every planet moves at a slightly different speed and the ones farther away from the sun move more slowly, um, planets are singing um, songs in different ranges, and when you, here I can show you, uh, when you uh, compare the uh, maximum and minimum speeds of adjacent planets, you also get harmonic ratios. Um, so what you end up getting, according to Kepler, are the planets uh, singing, uh, poly uh, producing polyphonic harmonies as they move through the cosmos. Um, Kepler argued that it was significant, that, it was, that in his day people had developed a form of um, singing and harmony that was able to model this kind of cosmic um, singing. Um, and he posited music as a way for people to appreciate um, both the um, cosmic harmonies and um, the immensity of time that they moved through. So this is what he said in The Harmony of the World. The motions of the heavens are nothing but a certain perpetual concord, rational, not audible, through dissonant tunings, marking and distinguishing with those notes the immensity of time. It is therefore no longer surprising that a method of singing together was finally discovered by man, aping his creator that was unknown to the ancients, namely so that he could play the, pepper, the, the perpetuity of all time, the time of the world in a few short parts of an hour through the artificial symphony of many voices. He can thus taste to an extent the pleasure of God the creator in his works by the most agreeable sense of pleasure he feels from this imitator of God, music. Uh, Kepler then comes back to the question of why it is that the uh, original data from the Mysterium Cosmographicum didn't quite fit the astronomical data. Why did the platonic solid theory not match exactly the numbers that um, astronomy yielded? And in his Epitome of Copernican Astronomy of 1620, one year after the Harmony, he offers a slightly different answer to this question. So I'll show you um, 
take two on the lack of perfect accuracy between the astronomical data and the platonic solid theory. So the epitome of Copernican astronomy is a textbook. It's written in question and answer form. And the question he asks is, if the intervals agree with the ratio of the figures so closely, why does there remain some discrepancy? Which is the question that worried him with the initial publication. There he had pointed to the um, imperfection of astronomy and the slow nature of astronomical progress as the answer. Here he pointed to the fact that the platonic solids were not the only archetype structuring the cosmos. And what he says is this. Because the archetype of the movable world corresponds not only to the five regular figures by which the paths of the planets and the number of courses were assigned, but also to the harmonic proportions through which the courses themselves have been attuned to a certain idea of celestial uh, music or harmonic concord in six voices. Uh, sorry through which the courses themselves have been attuned to a certain ideal of celestial music or harmonic concord in six voices. Moreover, because that ornate music required a difference in the motion of each individual planet from the slowest to the fastest, a difference brought about by the variation of the interval between the planet and the sun, and because the quantity or ratio of this variation was required to be different in different planets, therefore it was necessary for some very little bit to be taken away from the intervals determined by those figures which are produced by the figures uniformly without variation, so that free Freedom should be left to the harmonist to represent the harmonies of the motions. Right? The idea here is that um, if you try to figure out how things work through only one archetype or only one theory, you're going to miss something because the world is more complicated than that. It is generated by, you might say, a polyphony of structuring forms, the platonic solids being one of them and the harmonies being another. So just to leave you with um, a couple of closing thoughts, um, Kepler's goal, I hope it's clear, is that theories should explain what we see around us. They shouldn't just match what we see around us. This is one reason why he was so uh, taken with Copernican theory, which he felt explained, for example, the relationship that the data suggested between the sun and planetary motions, while Ptolemaic theory could just match them but couldn't explain them. What he wanted to do, though, was explain more than Copernicus ever could. That was always his goal. Um, and he suggests, I think, the sort of grandiose nature of this goal um, in the epitaph that he composed for himself shortly before his death, um, which I, I give you here, um, though we're celebrating his life. I used to measure the skies. Now I measure the shadows of Earth. Although my mind was skybound, the shadow of my body lies here. Right, a, a sort of very grandiose vision of what it is he hoped to accomplish uh, with his mind. In contrast to this, I wanted to show you another image um, that he created of himself. Um, this is uh, built into the base of the Temple of Astronomy that Kepler creates as the frontispiece to the Rudolphine Tables. And in it, you see Kepler himself working by the light of a candle, building the, found, you know, the, the top of the Temple of Astronomy. He has pen and ink in front of him and he's sort of laboriously writing down numbers on the tablecloth in front of him while the names of his major works float above him. Um, and I think what the juxtaposition of these two suggests is that uh, the work of science and the work of astronomy can be uh, both breathtakingly uplifting and also sometimes laboriously tedious, right? And that both of these are true. Um, and that sometimes even your contemporaries will not appreciate what you're saying. This is what Kepler uh, suggests at the end of his Harmony of the World. He says, if you forgive me, I shall rejoice. If you are enraged with me, I shall bear it. See, I cast the die and I write the book. Whether it is to be read by the people of the present or of the future makes no difference. Let it await its reader for a hundred years, if God himself has stood ready for 6,000 years for one to study him. In other words, Kepler was writing to us too. <laughs> Thank you. Happy to take any questions if there are any. Thank you. That was a wonderful talk. We appreciate that. Um, I, you pointed out the mentor mentee relationship that kind of kept Kepler going and, and got him over the hump when mm -hmm. he was stuck. And it, it calls to mind how critical our mentoring of young scientists is so key, uh, and not that much different in these relationships from what you described then versus now. Um, that 
made me wonder what about his early life may have facilitated his advanced mind and, and all of these different fields and these interdisciplinary perspectives prior to really being at that stage where he had major mentors in the field. Was there something in his childhood or in his upbringing that really facilitated this ability to think in this way? or whether um, he was just that good at math that they thought he'd be more suited to a mathematical career. But in any case, he was told um, you know, that his job post-Tubing in was to go off and you know, teach at a, a Lutheran high school in Graz. But it was at Tubing in where he first met Michael Mestlin as a young student. Um, and that was a lucky meeting for him because um, you know, I mentioned that Kepler is one of the first Copernicans. You know, at, at about this time, there are very few people who genuinely believe that Copernican theory is true. There are a lot of people who are using yet to calculate motions, but, um, but think it's you know, a useful tool and that's it. Meslin is one of the few. So Meslin is an early formative influence in somebody who teaches him um, that he can um, approach astronomy uh, both seriously and also realistically, right? He can, he can take Copernican theory as something real and true. And for him, uh, when, he, when he feels like his uh, theological goals have been pushed off course, he sort of reframes what it is he's doing. He says, all right, um, I'm not a priest of the book of scripture, but now I'm a priest of God with respect to the book of nature. So it's sort of those early interests that, um, that lead him um, to the kind of work he does where he wants to explain everything and, since he, and thinks he has the power to do so. Um, I would say too, though, that you know, to the point about um, these mentor-mentee relationships being significant today too, and you know, seeing them in the historical record, I think one of the virtues of, of doing you know a, a more nuanced history of science is that these parts of the story, the part where you know the person who will eventually be famous writes to his mentor and says, "I don't know if I've gotten it right. I need help." Like these tend to not get mentioned um, in you know your classic textbooks. You hear about the achievements, but not about the struggles along the way. And I think um, studying those kinds of things are not just helpful for understanding history, right? They're helpful for practicing scientists who, um, who can, I think, recognize that um, this has always been hard and tricky, and I've always worried about, people have always worried about how others will read their work and have tried to, to you know, tackle that head on. So, so that's one thing I think, um, one, one reason I think it's important to, to tell these stories in this way. Uh, so thank you. So I, I have a related question. It's not even a well-posed question, so <laughs> forgive me, but um, seeing this at the end certainly reminds me of, of having some idea of the kind of detailed calculations that you have to make. I literally imagined him working late many nights by candlelight because mm -hmm. that's what it would take. Yeah. Um, and also in the early example of you showing the, the lines making triangles, he had the obsession to make a complete circle of that and realize that you inscribe an inner circle, right? This is. This is a, something um, that speaks to an obsessiveness of character that was important, I think. And I can recognize a little bit in myself and, and other colleagues even. And so, um, and that's a very self-driven thing rather than a mentor thing. So I, I wonder if you could comment at all or a bit more on the obsessiveness of character mm -hmm. here. I think if I'm remembering right, right, this is the way that Arthur Kessler describes Kepler as you know having a sort of um, kind of maniacal drive. Um, but I also think it's rooted in Kepler's in this sort of geometrical archetypal idea, right? Kepler is. Um, convinced that the universe is geometric, that our minds work geometrically, and that God is a geometer. And so what this means is literally he thinks he can read the mind of God. <laughs> I mean, th th this theory provides a kind of confidence that we can get it right, which I think, you know, um, without it, you know, how, how do you really know whether you're hitting on the truth or not? I mean, this is a sort of theological question that people posed before Kepler. How can we know anything about God at all? And it's a question that natural philosophers asked about the world. How can we know that we're right? about the world. And for Kepler, we can know all of those things because the same archetype structures everything. So in part, I think, I'm, I'm sure that this is a personality issue too. And Kepler actually, you know, for those who are curious about his personality, not only does he write horoscopes for other people, but he, he writes self-horoscopes that are basically personality analyses of himself <laughs> and his relationships with his family members. He writes them for family members too. And he does describe himself in this way as very, you know, a very driven kind of person. But I think, you know, to have the, the kind of confidence that Kepler had that you could get it right um, because of the way things are structured is important too.
I was wondering if he, it was a leap for him to go from drawing two-dimensional circles to three-dimensional, because that's not so easy to, mm -hmm. to, to do it and draw it on a piece of paper. And if he write anything about that struggle of going from a 2D model to a 3D model. He does. In fact, the beginning of the Mysterium is him going through the different attempts he made before he gets to the platonic solids, and he starts two-dimensionally. So he does narrate that. It doesn't take him that long, though. Um, and I think that um, this is because, because of the importance of uh, ge geometry and you know, physical solid bodies to Kepler. He, he has a discussion at some point in the Mysterium about how um, numbers aren't actually real, but things are real, right? So he has, talks about the difference between counting numbers and counted numbers. Um, he thinks that um, uh, things that are real in the universe are physical geometrical things. This is also why he ends up getting excommunicated, because he finds um, the Lutheran doctrine of the illocal presence of Christ to be geometrically meaningless, because he believes so strongly that you know if you're talking about something real, it has to be physically real in a three-dimensional sense. So, um, so yes, he does, he does begin playing with two-dimensional figures because of what he drew, um, but his own um, beliefs about you know, what the world is like and and what's real in the world push him pretty quickly in his own um, description of the process toward three-dimensional objects. And then from there, the leap to the platonic solids is not very great. And I will welcome up to the podium uh, our next speaker and our guest artist, Bruce Dickey. Bruce. Thank you, and good morning. I can't speak to you this morning as a scholar of Johannes Kepler, or as a scientist, or even as a historian or a historian of science. I want to simply speak to you as a musician, um, but a musician who has been quite unexpectedly touched by the legacy of this amazing man, Johannes Kepler. I'd like to say a few words about how that came about and what the consequences have been for me and my colleagues, hoping along the way not to misconstrue too much of the science. A few years back, I was asked by a major music festival in Belgium to make a proposal on the theme Cosmos. Now, <clears throat> I need to take a step back here and explained that I play the cornetto, a wind instrument with a cup-shaped mouthpiece like a brass instrument, but finger holes like a woodwind. This instrument, which I have spent the best part of my life trying to revive after its long period of obsolescence, was at the absolute height of its development um, during Kepler's lifetime. He will have had many occasions to hear it played in the musical sphere surrounding him in Württemberg, Tübingen, Graz, and above all, in Prague. The cornetto was highly praised for its ability to imitate the human voice and played principally in churches, but also at court entertainments all over Europe, but especially in the axis between <coughs> Venice, Vienna, and Prague. In my activity in reviving this instrument, I founded in the 1980s an ensemble called Concerto Palatino, comprised of a flexible mixture of wind and string instruments and voices. It was this group that the Belgian festival was interested in engaging on the theme of cosmos. <clears throat> At first, I was a bit mystified how our instruments could relate to such a theme, since most of the music we play is based on Latin liturgical texts. <clears throat> After exploring a while on the internet, I bumped repeatedly into the figure of Johannes Kepler. Of course, like any reasonably educated person of my age, I was aware of him and his importance to the field of astronomy. I was aware that he was part of the rejection of the geocentric view of the solar system and knew he was somehow important in the development of the telescope. <coughs> But my active knowledge ended about there. I began reading, and the more I read about him, the greater was my fascination and my awareness of his relevance to my musical world. 
Ultimately, my fascination led to a recording project and a couple of performances, but the project was deemed too expensive by the Belgian festival that initiated it. The CD carries the name of Nature's Secret Whispering, Music in the Cosmology of Johannes Kepler. And I make a little plug, it's available for purchase <laughs> at the back of the room, along with some other CDs of Julie and, and other colleagues. Um, <clears throat> in this CD, we attempted to reconstruct the musical soundscape of Kepler's world combining composers with whom we knew Kepler was familiar and other composers working in his immediate environment, especially in Graz and Prague. Orlando di Lasso, Andrea Gabrieli, Hans Leo Hassler, Annibale Perini, Lambert de Sèvres, and Erasmus Widmann. We also com commissioned a composer, Calliope Zupaki, who is now the composer laureate of the Netherlands, to write a new piece inspired by Kepler's thinking. But let's return uh, to Kepler and his musical background. Kepler was not a musician. <clears throat> he makes that clear at numerous points in his writings as he defers to the practical musicians of his time. He makes no claims to mastery of the theory and practice of music. And yet, as the great 18th century music historian Charles Burney wrote, the great mathematician and astronomer Kepler in his Harmonia Mundi speaks upon the subject of music like a man who had not only thought of it as a science subservient to the laws of calculation, but studied it as an elegant art and been truly sensible to its powers. <clears throat> as musicians, indeed as 21st century musicians, Kepler does not primarily speak to us from the realm of mathematics and astronomy. But as a man living in a troubled time, or perhaps I should say in a different troubled time, <clears throat> he was a deeply religious Protestant living in a time of religious turmoil from which he would frequently suffer. He was a tireless defender of his mother against charges of witchcraft, while still believing, I understand, in the existence of witches. He was a defender of a new conception of the solar system, risking accusations of heresy. And above all, he was a man searching for harmony, a harmony that was badly lacking in the world around him. He found this harmony both in music and in the heavens, and expended a considerable amount of effort in demonstrating and explaining the relationship between these kinds of harmony. Kepler grew up in the musical traditions of Protestantism in Württemberg. From his fifth year, he studied German psalmody, as well as Latin sequences and hymns, which he later cites in his Harmonia Mundi. In addition to daily singing, there were weekly theory lessons. He would have studied counterpoint and figural music. It has been said that Kepler continued and deepened his musical studies in Tübingen during his theological studies. There, the academic ordinances prescribed singing three days a week so that the students must always study new motets and good songs and thus keep the exercise of music in practice. He also likely participated in performances of church music and in private festivities. <clears throat> so, encouraged by Kepler's sympathies and his respect for the practical side of music, I continued reading. <clears throat> Of course, no modern musician who has studied something of the history of his art can be unaware of the ancient concept of cosmic harmony, the music of the spheres, uh, depicted so nicely on my t-shirt. <laughs> um, it was universally believed that the planets in their movements produced tones, and Pythagoras, of course, demonstrated on the monochord the relationships between string length and pitch that solidified the relationship between mathematics and music. But what interested me more was how Kepler modified and in some cases abandoned these ancient ideas. Kepler rejected the idea that the movements of planets produced audible tones, since he reasoned that there was no medium in space by which these sounds could be transmitted. But nevertheless, his observations of planetary movement 
radically altered in his mind the nature of this celestial music. <clears throat> a lot of Kepler's reasoning about celestial harmony relies on the shapes of the planetary orbits, which he, of course, famously observed to be elliptical. If we relate the angular velocity of a planet's movement to a musical tone, a planet moving in a circle, in a circular orbit, would produce only one tone. But if a planet moves in an elliptical orbit, its angular velocity will vary according to its distance from the sun, moving most quickly at the closest point and most slowly at the furthest point. Thus, each planet, depending on the shape of its orbit, defined a unique musical interval by the proportion between its greatest and smallest angular velocities. <clears throat> and filling in the notes in between, uh, a particular scale or mode as well. Thus, Mercury, whose orbit is the most elliptical, has the widest interval and most available tones, while Venus, as the most circular, sings only one tone. The Earth, nearly as circular, sings two tones a minor second apart, thus mi, fa, using the solemnization syllables of the time, causing it to sing its music in the Phrygian mode, which emphasizes this interval. Using Tycho's da data, Kepler began to work with pairs of planets. He showed that the speed of Saturn at perihelion and Jupiter at aphelion were in the ratio of one to two, corresponding to an octave. Similarly, the ratio, the ratio between the speeds of Mars at perihelion and Earth at aphelion was one to three, a perfect fifth, and so on. He reasoned that given an infinite uh, span of time, each planet would occupy all possible relationships to the other planets, thus creating all of the harmonies heard in music. The miracle for Kepler was that this music would be polyphonic, composed of multiple sonorities superimposed one upon the other, and independently moving strands or melodies. But this music moved very slowly, billions if not trillions of years for a cadence to occur if one involves all of the planets. But man, he argued, whose man, mind was created in the image of God in developing polyphonic music, created a parallel to the harmony of the spheres on a human scale. Thus, the most perfect polyphonic music was that in six parts, corresponding to the six planets known to him. This polyphonic music caused the celestial relationships and cadences to occur within a human span of time and caused it to be audible to the human ear. But at this point, a doubt crept into my mind. If you could convert these movements of the planets with their shifting angular velocities and the convergences of their harmonic proportions into sound, surely the result would be a constantly shifting series of glissandi, since the planets exhibit constant motion and not a series of discrete intervals. It would resemble an unbelievably slow motion series of siren-like undulations. There are some, I discovered, who have actually tried to produce such a music with computers and synthesizers. You can hear the result on YouTube. <laughs> it is fascinating and eerie for a moment, and ultim ultimately deadly boring, <laughs> even though enormously speeded up. <clears throat> In my opinion, this sort of music would not have interested Kepler in the least. There is, in fact, a passage in the Harmony of the World where Kepler speaks of glissandi. He's trying to grapple with what distinguishes the calls to prayer of Muslim cantors and Gregorian chant. He determines that it is the intervals of the former which do not correspond to mathematical proportions, but even more, it is the glissandi which he finds to be barbaric. It strikes me that what Kepler was really trying to do was to find parallels in his observations of the heavens to the polyphonic music of the 16th century, which he so loved. In a certain sense, the music of Orlando di Lasso and others was his point of departure. It's my impression that the peace and harmony that Kepler found in listening to that music was a harmony he wished and finally succeeded in finding in the heavens. <clears throat> but this brings us back to the point which is most fascinating to me, the seeming tension between Kepler's 
scientific and mathematical reasoning about music, and the intuition he developed in his practical experience with music. The amazing thing to me is that he seems time after time to defer to his practical experience and ultimately to his ear. In 1599, he wrote to a friend that he wished Orlando, if he lived, could teach him to tune a keyboard properly. Now, tuning a keyboard to a scientifically oriented astronomer would seem to me to be a question of measurement and mathematics. But he tells us that Orlando di Lasso, the ultimate practical musician, and not Pythagoras, would be the best person to teach him to tune his instrument. <clears throat> that is also because the tunings and temperaments used by practical musicians at the time went against the teachings of Pythagoras. Kepler confirmed that the most beautiful major and minor thirds and sixths were indeed not those defined in the proportions of Pythagoras, but those made possible by the deliberate mistuning of fifths and to favor pure thirds. How did Kepler make peace with the taste of his ear, which clearly clashed with the pure mathematics of his astronomical observations? Or did he? Could he have felt that peace and harmony on Earth required compromise of a sort not found among the heavenly bodies? <clears throat> In trying to reconcile astronomical data and musical practice, Kepler displays a great deal of creativity. Though I must say the results are not always totally convincing and can elicit a smile here and there. He makes the point that the planets are singing a polyphonic motet a la Orlando di Lasso. And he explicitly, explicitly directs us to practical musicians, contemporary or just previous to him, in order to hear nature's secret whispering. Here is his most poetic rendering of this idea. Follow me, modern musicians, and attribute it to your arts unknown to antiquity. In these last centuries, nature, always prodigal of herself, has at last brought forth, after an incubation of twice a thousand years, you, the first true offprints of the universal whole. By your harmonizing of various voices and through your ears, she has whispered of herself as she is in her innermost bosom to the human mind, most beloved daughter of God the Creator. In this cosmic motet, Kepler identifies the particular vocal part of each planet. The soprano is Mercury with the largest melodic span. The Earth and Venus sing the alto with very narrow distances between their motions, as the alto, which is nearly always the highest in a narrow space. The tenor is sung by Mars, while Saturn and Jupiter, as basses, make harmonic leaps with few notes. <clears throat> of special importance here is that, having escaped the geocentric cosmos, Earth is free not only to orbit the sun, but to sing its own song. This song of the Earth brings us to the other side of Kepler's reasoning on music, the importance of rhetoric. <clears throat> Kepler was not only interested in music as the human reflection of the proportions of heavenly bodies, nature's secret whispering, but as a student and teacher of the art of rhetoric, he recognizes that music must speak, communicate, and sing human passions. Thus, the song of the earth is determined by its narrow interval, the minor second, or stated in terms of psalmization syllables, mi, fa, mi. The earth, so full of pain and lamentation, <clears throat> sings, he tells us, of misery and famine, mi, fa. Confronting the worlds of astronomical observation and musical rhetoric. One of the pieces that Lasso, uh, one of the pieces of Lasso that Kepler cites in his comments on rhetoric is the five-voice motet in Me Transierunt. This was quite a famous piece already in Kepler's day and was famously analyzed in 1606 in terms of musical rhetorical devices by the theorist Joachim Burmeister. It seems likely from Kepler's remarks that he knew this analysis. Though the motet, being in five parts, fails to fulfill Kepler's ideal of six-part polyphony, he seems to have been particularly moved by it. It is indeed a wonderful piece and features prominently both in our CD and on tonight's concert. 
Kepler is struck especially by the opening figure of an ascending minor sixth resolving downwards by a minor second. This highly unusual melodic beginning for an imitative polyphonic motet powerfully evokes wailing. This quality of lamentation pervades the motet due to the prominence of the minor second, mi fa, in its Phrygian mode, the song of the earth. <clears throat> so in the end, my fascination with the ideas of Johannes Kepler led me to explore a repertoire of music that must have inspired Kepler as well. Nature's secret whispering has touched all of us who were involved in it profoundly. I hope it will have moved others who have listened to the recording and that they will have found in it something of the peace and harmony Kepler professes to have found in it as well and which he so wished to achieve on earth. Thank you. Any comments or questions? Yeah. No, I, was, I was wondering, uh, you, you were saying that you know, his astronomical theories were putting him at risk of being accused of heresy. And it seems like at the time, music would have often been performed in, in a religious context. Do you, do you have any thoughts? Was he really inviting trouble by also bringing music into his theory of, uh, of, the, of the cosmos? Bring it into the theory of. Um, I mean, relating music to his sort of controversial theory, was he really risking ire? Because, I mean, the theory of uh, the planetary motion has some theological bearing, but if taking this music that's used, uh, you know, to glorify God in religious contexts and then saying that and that's also a part of this new planetary theory, was that, was that putting him at risk of, of you know, further accusations? Of, of heresy or? Yes, I, I don't, I can't answer that really. I, but I, I mean, it does strike me that he says at one point, he wishes God would free him of the bonds of astronomy so that he could uh, tend what is his real goal, which is harmony on earth and harmony on earth being both music and he hopes to go beyond that and to, to in a political way to, to create some kind of uh, harmony there. So I, I, that's all I can offer on that. Excellent talk, very interesting. I was particularly interested in your comments about different temperaments at the time. Yes. <clears throat> um, I assume that Kepler was sufficiently sophisticated in his musical training to know the mathematics of the different temperaments? And, and you said he was relying on Pythagorean yeah. uh, temperament, uh, and well, which was, as, if I understood you correctly, not um, the preferred temperament used by musicians at the time. And I guess my, I mean, I, I'd like you to comment on that. But also my question is, uh, these were uh, in Kepler's analysis, these were intended to mimic vocal motets. And vocal music maybe had a little bit more flexibility as compared to instrumental music in, to, in terms of uh, choice of temperament. So that, that's yeah. the question. Well, I, I mean, <clears throat> I think Kepler was very well aware that musicians of his day um, pretty universally uh, made use of uh, mean tone temperament, quarter comma mean tone temperament, when a temperament is necessary. But temperament is something that applies to keyboard instruments. And if you have instruments like voices or trombones um, set free from a keyboard instrument, they even go beyond the uh, mean tone temperament and try to achieve the closest thing to just tuning. Um, and there are many, many theoretical discussions of how you fit together uh, these different um, classifications of instruments. But I'm sure he would have been aware that no one in his day was using Pythagorean thirds. They were all um, using pure thirds, and he says that a number of times that 
the beauty, the ear requires the beauty of pure thirds. And if you understand anything about temperaments, you know that the only way to achieve pure thirds is by sacrificing the pure fifths. And so tuning, this is why he wants Orlando to tune his keyboard, because tuning, a mean tone temperament, is not a, a mathematical proposition. It's a question of listening to the fifth and making it just enough out of tune that you know the third will be pure, and then making them all sound the same. It's a very practical uh, consideration. And he's, he seemed to be very well aware of that and happy to accept the compromise that was necessary to achieve that kind of beautiful uh, consonants. Yes. Thank you for that. Um, I also, I, I can't help but wonder if that problem of the mathematical perfection of the Pythagorean tuning and the <clears throat> oral perfection of the temperaments can again be chalked up to that uh, problem he had with the cosmos of uh, it, there being still some discrepancy even after he thought he'd solved it. <laughs> um, but I have a different question. Um, uh, I wonder, we know what he um, thinks about um, the six-part voices and those kinds of uh, music. I wonder if you have, can comment on what he might have thought about your own instrument, the cornetto, uh, which would have been so popular at the time, I believe. <laughs> Did he write anything, or do we have any idea no, if he was he, a fan he, or anything? No, he didn't. I mean, it would have, he would have heard it everywhere at that time in that part of the world. Um, he doesn't say much about instruments. He talks about vocal music. But, um, I mean, the cornetto was supposed to be the best imitator of the human voice, so he must have been in inclined to <laughs> accept that as well. Thank you for the fascinating talk. Um, I was struck by what you said, um, how he was a deeply religious Protestant, and yet he's citing all of these um, mainly Catholic composers and Latin liturgical texts extolling Gregorian chant as opposed to other monophonic mm -hmm. chants. And how do you think he, he reconciled that with his own faith, which was um, trying to uh, install the vernacular as the liturgical language? Um, I mean, all of these composers, um, many of these composers wrote Catholic music and Protestant music and um, Gregorian chant is at at, at the uh, as a building block of also many kinds of Protestant music. So I don't think there was a conflict with the Gregorian chant. Um, I don't know about uh, uh, how he would have how, what he would have felt about. Uh, Catholic music and whether that uh, was a, uh, a problem for him, but uh, I don't have a better answer to that. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I th thank you. Thank you very much. Ah, good morning. Um, so th I'd like to thank of you for organizing this amazing conference. I'm already like have learned a tremendous amount, and I, you know, probably should have known this before preparing a, a presentation for this for this event. Um, but I'm happy to I have the opportunity to tell you sort of a story about how um, a lot of these ideas that Kepler was thinking about uh, have a resonance in uh, modern physics. Um, specifically, um, he's thinking he's looking at the the natural world and saying, you know observing these, this uh, order and symmetry and patterns and thinking, well, there must be a fundamental reason why these emerge. It can't just be random. Um, and so I'm going to tell you how uh, in, in, in some uh, modern questions in physics, uh, we're using similar ideas and with modern tools, both uh, the, to understand maybe process the processes that might have happened uh, very shortly after the Big Bang uh, to questions about uh, formation of things like snowflakes and then also in some uh, recent work I've done to understand the structure of, of music theory. Uh, so as an example of a system where order emerges out of randomness, uh, here's a video of um, 
of a snowflake forming. And so there are random, uh, randomly moving uh, water molecules in the air, and they're condensing together to form ice. And somehow they know where to go uh, to form this symmetric, ordered structure. And so as, as Aviva briefly mentioned, this is an idea that Kepler thought about uh, in, in this book. Uh, he wrote in 1611, New Year's gift concerning six-cornered snow or snowflakes. Um, and as I understand it, this was sort of a, uh, written as a, a, as a gag gift um, for his patron, uh, a, a, for, for a New Year's gift. And um, because he said uh, he couldn't think of anything to give his patron uh, as a gift. And so this is like, no, this is now like predating Seinfeld by like 400 years almost. Uh, he said, I'm gonna write a book about nothing. Uh, the most mundane everyday thing you could think of, like a snowflake, and ask a lot of deep questions about why does this order emerge um, in a snowflake? And at the time, he didn't have uh, the, the tools that we have today of statistical mechanics and thermodynamics to answer that question, but he had a lot of ideas. Uh, uh, that are very interesting and, and it's an amusing read as well. Um, but so today what we would say is why does order emerge in phase transitions, uh, like from a gas to, to a liquid to a solid, is that it comes about because of a balance of energy and entropy. Systems have a tendency to go to low energy. They also have, uh, which is usually an ordered state of matter, and they also have a tendency to go to high entropy, which is a, usually a disordered state of matter. So these two things are in conflict with each other. And so how does it system decide whether to become ordered or disordered, and the answer is the temperature. You could define temperature as how much increase in energy you're willing to trade for an increase in entropy. So as the temperature changes, suddenly the balance shifts, and you go from a disordered state to an ordered state. So uh, we're, we're all familiar with, say, how this happens with the phase transitions between, say, a solid, liquid, and gas, um, say, starting in the, in the phase of water, uh, the solid phase of water, ice. It's a very ordered structure. It has low entropy, uh, low energy, uh, and I'll argue it also has low symmetry. And so you might think, well, no, it looks very symmetric. And it looks symmetric, but if you think about, you know, uh, how, how many ways could you rotate a snowflake to have it look the same? There are six ways you could rotate it, a sixth of the way, two-sixths of the way, and so on. But if you increase the temperature, you go to a slightly more disordered phase, water. Um, and if you take that glass of water, you could rotate it by any amount, and it would look the same if you have a circular glass. Uh, and so that has much more symmetry, not just the six-fold symmetry, but an infinite number of rotations. Uh, and so that's something that's characteristic of phase transitions is that uh, as you go down in temperature to more ordered phases, you lose symmetry. Symmetry is broken. Uh, and um, uh, it, it's striking that the sort of the lower symmetry state maybe is the more interesting, intricate, beautiful one. Uh, and then if you increase temperature further, of course, we get to the gas phase, which is even uh, more disordered than water, than the liquid, uh, with high energy and high entropy and uh, complete symmetry. It looks the same no matter which way you shift it or look at it. Um, so in the context of this talk, I want to use a simpler model than water because water is actually very complicated when you start digging into the details. So the model I'll, I'll be talking about is this uh, so square lattice of arrows. So I've got nine arrows drawn there in a, in a square arrangement. Uh, and the arrows will be allowed individually to rotate to any angle. Uh, so here they're shown all pointing in the same direction, and that's the lowest energy configuration. So the lowest energy is when each arrow is aligned with its neighbors. The highest energy is when they're opposite their neighbors. So if I allow, allow the central arrow to rotate, uh, as it becomes oppositely aligned, the energy is maximized. We got a brighter color on the plot there. And then as it comes around in a circle, it is lo at low energy again. So we can use this model to do computer simulations of what happens uh, when you change the temperature. So as an example, at very low temperature, we have a lot of arrows here now, and uh, they're uh, mostly all aligned in the same direction. So that would be a very ordered, low entropy state. Um, and again, I, a low symmetry, meaning that if I make a plot of, of how many arrows there are pointing in each direction, um, they're almost all pointing in the same direction. And if I look at that plot, I think, well, how can I rotate it to make it look the same? There's only one way I can do it. I have to rotate it all the way around. So it's basically not symmetric. Now, if you increase the, the temperature, the arrows become randomly uh, oriented. Uh, and so this is the, the high energy, high temperature state. It's disordered. 
And in this case, I would say it has high symmetry because if I make that same plot of how many arrows there are with each different angle, uh, it just looks like there's, they're in all angles. Uh, and so it's a circle which I could rotate however I want. So that's a high symmetry state. So going from the high symmetry state to the low symmetry state, symmetry is broken. So anytime you see a system in nature that is lacking symmetry, that has a, or has only limited symmetries, you might think that maybe a phase transition was involved in creating that order. Okay, so that's the model. How can we understand this to understand things about the formation of the universe? So let me tell you, what do we know about the universe already? Uh, you know, we've, we've made some progress since Kepler's time. And so I'll sort of walk you through the development of our, our, our fundamental understanding of the universe, so-called the standard model uh, of particle physics uh, throughout what we learned in the 20th century. So at the beginning of the 20th century, we would have said there are particles, like electrons, and there are fields, like the electromagnetic field. That is like the electric field and the magnetic field. And the electromagnetic field exerts a force on electrons. The electromagnetic field fills space, and it has some value and direction at every point, and depending on that value, exerts a force on an electron. Uh, you also have like the gravitational field, which exerts uh, force on anything with mass. And we also knew at the beginning of the 20th century that uh, in the electromagnetic field, waves in that field are light. There are uh, waves of, uh, where the electric field basically wigg wiggles like ripples in a pond. Uh, but then, near the beginning of the 20th century, we found out that these waves of light also act like particles in certain situations, uh, and we call those particles photons. So now we've got two particles, but also this wave-particle duality. Not long thereafter, people realized that electrons also act like waves, not just like particles. And so now, actually, everything is a field. Electron, there's an electron field, and the waves in that field are particles. Then we discovered there's a whole lot more particles. Uh, six quarks that make up protons and neutrons. The muon and the tau particle that don't affect us very much at all. Three different kinds of neutrinos that affect us even less. Um, these all have different properties. It's hard to see probably, but they have mass, charge, and spin that are all these just seemingly random numbers. Uh, then we discovered there's also more forces. There's a, a force called the strong force, uh, which has its associated particle, the gluon, and uh, the weak force, which has two particles, the Z particle and the W particle. So this is where we were kind of middle of the 20th century. And it's a very beautiful model. It's very intricate. It works very well, um, but one thing it has is a startling lack of symmetry Why, and, and, and a lot of mysteries about it. Why are there 16 particles? Why uh, do the particles have the masses that they have and the other properties that they have? The four forces behave very differently from each other. Why are they so different? Uh, one thing it's hard to know is two of the four particles have no mass at all, the gluon and the photon, whereas the Z and W bosons are extremely heavy compared to the other particles. And so, and if you look at the mathematics, there's also this lack of symmetry that occurs. And so this is this question again, like sort of that Kepler was asking, you know, why do we have the planets we have with the orbits that they have? Uh, is there some fundamental underlying principle that governs this? Uh, and so this is where the idea of a phase transition came in. In the mid 20th century, people uh, like Peter Higgs and others had the idea that maybe the these forces are actually unified and part of different sides of the same thing. So maybe uh, the elect electromagnetic force and the weak force are actually two sides of the same coin. And the reason why they seem so different was because there was a phase transition in the early universe that caused them to be uh, separated. And uh, much, much later, uh, this idea was verified and we had a 17th particle, the Higgs. Um, which is now a part of the standard model. So to, to explain what I mean a little bit more by this, this uh, unification or symmetry breaking, uh, the idea is that in the very early universe, right after the Big Bang, it was very hot. Uh, and that caused this additional field, this Higgs field, to be disordered. So I've drawn that schematically by, again, this, this plot of, that shows you know, all angles being present of those arrows in a schematic representation. So it's very symmetric, but very disordered. And in this case, this symmetry means that the electromagnetic and weak forces uh, behave very similarly. So a, a short time later, a very short time later, about a tenth of a nanosecond after the Big Bang, the universe has expanded and cooled enough that a phase transition happens, just like a gas 
freezes into a, or condenses into a liquid or a solid. Um, and this field undergoes a phase transition. And so now I've drawn this plot where the arrows are mostly pointing in the same direction, but still wiggling around a lot. And those wiggles are the particles in the field, the Higgs particles or Higgs bosons. Uh, n by now, much later, uh, the temperature of the universe is much, much lower, and the Higgs field is completely ordered, and the electromagnetic and weak forces are now completely distinct, and we don't really see these Higgs particles anymore because the temperature is too low for uh, these particles to exist, these wiggles to happen in the field. So how can, so at mid 20th century, this was a nice idea. This was a theory. It was maybe a little bit weird, um, but the question is like, how can we test it? And so the way to test it was to create a machine that recreates the conditions of the early universe. And so this is the uh, Large Hadron Collider. Um, and uh, the, the picture on the uh, right shows um, the, the aerial schematic view of it spanning the border between Switzerland and France. This is an enormous device uh, that can accelerate particles and create these enormous energies that were present right after the Big Bang. So they did this, and they found the Higgs bosons. And so that's why we added that extra particle to the standard model. So that's an example of how these ideas of uh, symmetry and phase transitions and order can explain uh, the sort of uh, structure of the, the world we see around us. And it leads to the question, maybe we could go further. Uh, could we, we just combine two of those forces? Could we extend it to a third, or maybe even all of them? Uh, notice gravity doesn't come into this picture at all, because that remains quite a mystery, actually. But could we at least combine the, the electromagnetic force, the weak force, and the strong force into one? Um, and so this is the idea of these so-called so grand unified theories, that there's a, a, another field, another particle, and even earlier in the universe, after the Big Bang, uh, there was another phase transition that caused these forces to become separated. And so I, this is now at the status of nice idea, but how can we prove it? So it's not going to work to do the same thing we did with the Higgs. Uh, to build a, a big particle collider because the energies required are about 100 trillion times more than for the Higgs. It's already a pretty large machine, so uh, in the near future, that's unlikely to happen. But there is hope to test this theory because this phase transition that happened right at the beginning of the universe may have left imprints behind that we can still see today. So I'll illustrate that with this simulation here where uh, I have the disordered state of a bunch of arrows in this high energy disordered state and we'll see what happens when we cool it down very rapidly. So the arrows start to try to align with each other to go to the ordered low energy phase. But in this particular mo model, something happens, which is that in some parts uh, of, the, of the region, some arrows, say, point to the left. In other parts, they point up. In other points, they part down. They point down, and they can't come to an agreement. And so there are these red spots that remain even as it cools down. And you get these sort of swirling patterns called vortices. Uh, that are stuck there no matter how far you cool this down. And so these vortex, vortices or defects should still be here today. And of course, in, 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 in reality, this is not a two-dimensional picture, it's a three-dimensional picture. And so um, each of these red vortex cores actually forms a path through space that forms sort of a branching network of so-called cosmic strings. Um, and so this is a cartoon picture, of course, but uh, real, real astrophysicists can simulate this. And this is a, a simulation of the cosmic strings uh, from a group at Cambridge. And so they form this network of branching strings that thread throughout the universe. And they should be real physical objects if they exist. Um, uh, they should have mass and energy. They should uh, pull on things with gravity. They should interact with other particles. So we certainly have a hope of detecting them. Uh, so far, we have not detected them in our, in our uh, astrophysical observations. But as our, our measurements become more and more precise, there's hope that we will see evidence for these cosmic strings in the universe uh, and will help us make further sense of the structure that we see in the standard model. Now I'm going to switch gears completely and tell you how the same ideas can be used to understand uh, the structure of musical harmony. So this is some work I've been working on in, a, in recent years. Um, and we use the same methods uh, to understand things about the structure of, of music. And so what do, I, what do I mean by the structure of musical harmony? Well, uh, a notable thing about, about music is that, um, as opposed to sound in general, is that 
in, in, in sound, sound is made up of many frequencies. You could use any, any frequencies could be present in a sound. But in music, we use this dis discrete set of pitches. And uh, virtually every musical tradition that I'm aware of does this, uses some discrete division of frequencies to make sound, I mean, to make music. And uh, in Western music, we divide the octave into uh, 12 discrete pitches. Why 12? It's a very, very well conserved property uh, over many, many years, and many cultures around the world also used a 12 fold division of the octave. Um, from those 12 pitches, we often take a subset of them to form scales or chords. Um, and there are, just seems to be something very fundamental about this particular way of using sounds to make music. Um, so we're going to try to apply the same concepts that were used to understand the structure of, uh, of phase transitions and the processes that happen there. So whereas phase transitions in physics occur due to this balance of energy, I'm trying to go to low energy and high entropy, I'd argue that there's, there's two factors that lead us to create a system of harmony. One is that we want to minimize uh, dissonance. Some combinations of sounds are pleasant and consonant. Others sound harsh and dissonant. And so it stands to reason we would like to hear more pleasant combinations of sounds. But that's not the only thing that we want. If you took that to its logical extreme, you would have just a single pitch that's perfectly consonant, and you would just listen to that. <laughs> uh, but that, that might become boring. Uh, and so you also need complexity. You need to have enough possible variations within your system of music that you can write lots of different kinds of music uh, that, that satisfy the composers and the listeners. Uh, desire for, for new and interesting things. So these are two factors that are in co conflict with each other. And so which one wins? Well, it's a matter of taste, or you could define that to, as, as a matter of temperature. Uh, how much of an increase in dissonance you're willing to trade for an increase in complexity? So that's an idea, but if we can quantify this, if we can quantify dissonance and complexity within a system of harmony, then you can use all the same kinds of tools and mathematics that we use to understand phase transitions uh, to understand things about music. So we're going to use the same model, actually, this, this lattice of arrows. So remember what I showed you before, the arrows want to be aligned with each other. They have high, low energy if they're aligned, high energy if they're not aligned. In this case, an arrow is going to represent a musical tone. And the, air, the angle of the arrow represents the pitch of that tone. So why does it make sense to represent uh, a pitch on a circle? Well, it's because uh, if, you if you double the frequency of, of that pitch, uh, then you've increased the, 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 um, the, the pitch by one octave, which basically brings you back to where you started. So if you assume that all octaves are basically the same note, then it makes sense to put uh, your, uh, represent your pitch by an arrow on a circle. How do they interact with their neighbors? Well, the idea is that they should, they should form consonant combinations of sounds with their neighbors. So. Uh, the most consonant interval is the octave, or a unison, the same note played with itself. Uh, and that would represent the arrows being aligned, just like they were before, pointing in the same direction. But there are also other consonant intervals that occur at uh, 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 small, uh, simple integer ratios uh, around the circle. So we have four thirds and three halves are the perfect fourth and perfect fifth, um, five fourths and eight fifths give you uh, major thirds and minor sixths, and so on, uh, with uh, minor thirds and major sixths. And so we have a similar picture here for our musical uh, pitches. But now as you go around the circle, it's a much more complicated uh, uh, function of uh, dissonance versus the angle with the neighbors. Every time you hit one of these consonant intervals, you get a uh, lower dissonance. And so you can quantify this using equations. Um, and so that's what we've done here. So we're going to use the same model, but instead of the simple um, preference for alignment, we'll have a preference for, for consonant intervals. Uh, so we can plug this into a computer simulation. Uh, and so here what I'm doing is this is now a three-dimensional uh, lattice of tones. Uh, and instead of drawing arrows, I'm going to color code each tone. So each dot in that cube is a different tone. And the color indicates its pitch through an octave. And again, I'm plotting how many pitches there are at each different angle on the right. And um, you can see that this is the disordered state, where there's um, uh, complete randomness, complete symmetry uh, in that plot on the right. 
And then this will be a video where temperature suddenly decreases and we see what happens to the, both the colors on the lattice and the plot of which angles are, which pitches are present. So it jitters around a bit and then suddenly something happens. There's a phase transition. Uh, and now the plot on the right is, uh, it becomes ordered and less symmetric. In fact, there are 12, 12 spikes there in that picture, meaning there are 12 different colors or 12 different pitches present in this lattice. And so those 12 pitches, of course, correspond to the 12 pitches that we use in Western music. So this is just a property that emerges from this simple model that this 12-fold uh, division of the octave um, emerges just like the six-fold order emerges in, a, in, the, in the formation of a snowflake. Uh, so of course, we don't have to just look at this because this is a, a, each, each dot there represents a sound. We can listen to it, assuming the uh, AV setup here produces sound. Um, so what I have here is the exact same video I showed you in the previous slide, but now I'm zooming in on eight particular neighboring tones shown on the bottom there. And so this is the disordered state where they all have different colors and different random um, uh, uh, pitches. And now I'll click this and we'll see if it produces sound. So what you heard was the, the sound going from disordered cacophony at high temperature to uh, something that sounds more harmonious at low temperature. So it's the emergence of harmony as it undergoes this phase transition. Um, and so what's going on here, you notice on the, the cube uh, there's, has these patches of different colors. So each of those different colors is a region of uniform pitch, and there's 12 different pitches uh, within there. Um, and so the reason why that happened was the same reason that these cosmic strings formed in the early universe. Uh, when the phase transition happens, some regions of the lattice uh, begin to order towards one pitch, and other regions start to order towards another pitch, but they can't come to an agreement and never settle into anything, and instead form this, this patchwork uh, with boundaries between them. The boundaries between them are these uh, cosmic strings. And so in this zoomed in part here, you see there's two places where there's you know three different colors around a point. And so you could interpret those as a vortex with a vortex string passing through it. Um, and a place where you have three consonant pitches played together is a triad or a three note chord. Uh, and so you can interpret these, these strings as musical chords. We can take a closer look at that. I've, in this picture, I've drawn in all of these boundaries, these defects or vortex strings or tonal strings, if you like. Uh, and I'll get rid of the dots so you can see the strings better. And so there's this net, network of tonal strings, that, uh, the de these defects within this tonal lattice. Um, and that, to remind you, is analogous to the, co the cosmic strings that are predicted to, to thread throughout the universe. It, we can take a closer look at what these strings represent. And it turns out they closely mirror the kinds of chords that are used in music. Um, the, I've color-coded them here. So the green and red are uh, the common minor and, ma minor and major triads. Um, that are very commonly used in music. And then uh, uh, many other chords appear also, like seventh chords and suspended chords and, and many other things. Um, and so this, uh, this lattice is sort of representing um, the, the structure of musical harmony with paths along these strings representing progressions of harmony. So again, instead of just looking at it and talking about it, we can listen to it. And so what I have here is a zoomed in region of these uh, strings, and the black dot there will, will move along a path through the strings, and each note surrounding that vortex will uh, be given uh, an instrument, and we can hear the sound of these uh, tonal strings.
So this emergence of harmony on, this, on these tonal strings starts to lead us to ask, you know, what does this tell us about music, about the structure of music, where it comes from, but also it leads us to ideas that maybe you could use this to, as a new mechanism for composing music or performing music. And so those are some things that we're looking into now. And so to conclude, uh, the theme of this was, you know, grand unification and universality, which have meaning to everyone, but to scientists have actually specific meaning. Uh, and it, they mean that the order and symmetry that we observe in diverse systems ranging from the early universe to snowflakes to musical harmony all emerge from the same fundamental principles. And it, I think actually Kepler said it better in his book on the six-cornered snowflake, from this almost nothing, I have very nearly recreated the entire universe, which contains everything, which I think he said as a, as a joke, actually. Um, and so with that, I just want to thank the other people that worked with this, me on this project, uh, two students, uh, Hui Din and Ryan Bukele, uh, who are studying uh, physics and math and music here at Case, and uh, Alex Cook at the Cleveland Institute of Music, who is working with me now to uh, uh, translate these ideas into new ways of composing and performing music. And I want to thank um, the uh, College of Arts and Sciences here in their Expanding Horizons initiative and also the Coding Scholars program that have provided support for this. Uh, and you can read more about it, uh, the, the theory of music and, and uh, phase transitions in that paper there, or visit uh, these, these links on the web to read more and to hear more. Uh, and so thank you for your attention, and I'd uh, be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Jesse. Interesting take on musical harmony. A simple question. Your strings, whatever you developed, are they, they correspond to a single pitch? Uh, right. No. So, so the, what, the, um, the strings represent places where um, there is a sort of a vortex where the pitch changes rapidly around a point. And so it's, since it's a square lattice, it's, there's a square, and a vortex occurs when there's three or four distinct pitches around that point. Okay. Uh, Okay. Another thing, uh, this 12 basic uh, 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 pitches, right, that you derive, depend on the shape of your dissonance function, right? Mm -hmm. How did you find it? And then what happens if you would change it? Oh, very good question. So, um, so uh, that function uh, is, is calculated uh, based on um, the theory of um, uh, the roughness between the partials that make up the timbre of the sound. And so you have to assume a particular uh, spectrum for the sounds. And in this case, I used a harmonic spectrum, um, uh, like a sawtooth wave. Um, and that's what gives the particular shape of that function. Um, and so um, interestingly, if you change that assumption, you get different results. If you, so the, the, there's, there's a, the, the timbre of the instrument goes into that function, and then also a width of you know, how closely spaced frequencies have to be to sound dissonant. And so one thing you can do is you can crank down that width and say, well, maybe some people have a higher tolerance for hearing narrower frequencies. And then you can get things other than 12-fold divisions of the octave, but not just anything. For example, you, you get like 31-fold division of the octave. And that's something that people use in experimental music. Uh, and in fact, historically, going back to notable physicists such as Huygens, uh, have, have explored music written like that. Um, if you, other instruments don't have a harmonic spectrum, like uh, percussion instruments. Uh, and so if you get rid of the harmonic spectrum, you also lose the 12-fold division, and you're much more likely to get five or seven-fold division of the octave, uh, which are you know, sort of small prime numbers. And um, that is, in fact, what is often used in other cultures where they have a lot of percussion uh, gongs and cymbals and xylophones and things like that. So there's an interesting angle there in terms of history and in, indeed, you didn't ask about it, but uh, temperament, as we were discussing before, as you change the temperature, it, you can see uh, the historical uh, development of different temperaments also emerging. I have just uh, one small question I'm curious about. At the end, when you zoomed in on that, those harmonic strings, <laughs> if you will, um, and we got to hear them, it, is it possible, slash has anyone tried to notate some of those things that you hear? Yes, yeah, so that's what I mentioned. I'm, I'm working with Dr. Alex Cook at, at the Cleveland Institute of Music 
um, who is a music theorist and a composer. And we are working on uh, doing what I showed you and actually going a little bit further, including a rhythm, a model of rhythm as well, and some bringing in some ideas from, from regular you know, no, notions of composition to arrange these uh, pitches into, into musical compositions and then also to perform them. Hey Jesse, so in your picture on the right there, where you had the, not here in this thing, but your, six, your 12 uh, pitches, yes. some arrows seem larger than other ones. Is there a meaning or significance to that? So um, in, in, that, in that case, it's, it's just random. I mean, I think if, if you had an infinitely large cube, it should be, uh, they should all be the same. Uh, but one interesting thing, too, is that I didn't talk about is that if you zoom in on a smaller region, um, you actually start to see things like diatonic scales or pentatonic scales. Um, because the, the, the reason why all these things emerge is because the, the neighboring pitches are either octaves or fifths or thirds or things like that. They're usual consonant intervals. And if you have sort of a clump of things that are all related to each other by fifths and fourths and thirds, that's sort of what a scale is, is the set of notes that have a lot of those relationships together. And so that's why if you take this approach of moving along the strings to create music, you actually get things that start to sound familiar. Um, you can have um, collections of pitches that tend to adhere towards things that we are, are used to using in, uh, in musical compositions. So having created music through this network of strings, it's then tempting to go in and play God and remove all the minor chords or something like that. Uh, have you done that experiment? And if so, what happens when you do well, that? Um, I haven't done it. And one of the things that's tricky about it is that you can't really remove them. Uh, I mean, I could, you could delete them from the picture. But if you start from the, lat, the tone lattice, uh, it's an interesting feature of these defects that they're, uh, they're so-called topological defects that you can't remove. If you try to fix it, you'll create another defect somewhere else. Um, and so you almost have to have them. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for organizing this one. Uh, I'm your next speaker. Uh, I'm Chris Halfa from the philosophy department. Um, and uh, I'll be talking about philosophical problems exemplified by Kepler's discoveries. By contemporary standards, Johannes Kepler was not an exemplary scientist. His second most famous biographer, Arthur Kessler, described him as a sleepwalker who mostly by accident stumbled upon the discoveries which laid the foundation for Newton's scientific revolution. The eminent historian of science, Bernard Cohen, labeled him a tortured mystic whose weird contraption, consisting of nested, that's a quote, weird contraption, uh, consisting of nested platonic polyhedra inscribed in smaller and smaller fears was, quote, more dear to him than the three laws which bear his name. The fact that there are only five regular polyhedra gave him, in historian Owen Gingrich's soaring words, a rather cuckoo idea for, where, for why there would necessarily have to be six planets. In the Mysterium Cosmographicum, Kepler openly acknowledged the re relative legitimacy of the sun's claim to visible God. His reflections on the medieval metaphor of the music of the spheres led to the realization, stunning for him, that the ratio of maximum and minimum angular velocities for planets approximates the relationship between harmonious musical notes. As we've seen, this is just a small sample of the many strange observations, preoccupations, and investigations that characterize Kepler's research. And yet, in other ways, Kepler is one of the first instances in which we can see unambiguously the conceptual and methodological precepts that will come to define modern scientific inquiry. As such, it is in one way unremarkable that we also find reflected in his work several of the core philosophical puzzles that arise in the production of scientific knowledge. 
The fact that these puzzles are so easily discernible, even at this early stage, speaks to their intimate connection to the practice of science itself. Even for someone as weird as Kepler, these puzzles are sure to emerge because they are an inevitable byproduct of the struggle to understand nature. In this talk, I will give a brief outline of two canonical philosophical problems associated with inquiry in the context of some of Kepler's discoveries. They're notable for the way in which they exemplify the limitations of logical reasoning and for how they highlight the ineliminable influence of human judgment at each stage in the production of scientific knowledge. I first look at an instance of what can be called the stopping problem in scientific inquiry, uh, an instance which indeed underlies Kepler's fame as a transitional figure in the history of science. I then look at a couple of problems concerning the relationship between scientific knowledge and our knowledge of reality itself. Quote, the axiom of astronomy, celestial motion is circular and uniform or made of circular and uniform parts. These words were handwritten in Erasmus Reinhold's copy of Copernicus's On the Revolutions, discovered by astronomer and historian Owen Gingrich in 1973 in the Royal Observatory in Edinburgh. Gingrich would later find the same astronomical catechism inscribed in Paul Wittich's copy, then housed in the Vatican. Both Wittich and Reinhold belonged to the generation of astronomers that came after and in the wake of Copernicus's world-shifting book. And their faith in the axiom of, of astronomy is a poignant illustration of just how very traditional that book was. Neither Wittich nor Reinhold subscribed to heliocentrism, but they nevertheless saw Copernicus as squarely within the community of astronomers that extended back to Ptolemy. Heliocentric or not, his model embraced the axiom of uniform circularity. Um, and as Professor Rothman said, to some degree, uh, more so than his predecessors. The Ptolemaic orbital model was focused on circles, big circles, little circles, circles upon circles, and circles upon those circles. When an ancient astronomer observed the heavens, he was expected to interpret their motions under the general presupposition that those motions were perfect. That perspective in and of itself does not dictate what form a perfect motion must take, for ancient astronomers, the perspective that celestial motion is perfect is crystallized by the notion of circularity. Anything perfect is immutable. The only form of motion that is immutable is circular motion, being completely uniform and having no beginning and no ending. Armed with the frame of circularity, ancient astronomers would then attempt to interpret the observed changes in a celestial body's position as marking different spots along a circular path. Often, initially successful attempts to characterize celestial motions as circular would fail, as with retrograde motion when a body appears to sort of travel backwards. Uh, in the event, observed changes in the position of a celestial body were interpreted as the result of combinations of circular motions, rather than motions along some other kind of curve. Here, the drive to frame changes in position as some kind of manifestation of circular motion led astronomers to recharacterize celestial motion as motion around a circle whose center also traversed a circle around the Earth. Take the observation of a body's position over a period of time. See if you can fit that, uh, fit a circle around the Earth upon which they might fall. If no such circle exists, see if you can fit the positions onto a circle, an epicycle, traveling around a center, traveling around the Earth. If no such secondary circle exists, see if you can fit the positions onto a circle traveling around a center, traveling around a circle, traveling around a center, traveling around the Earth. If that fails, well, you know what to do. Hint, it involves circles. Uh, it was Kepler, not Copernicus, who broke with this tradition. What makes Kepler's astronomy distinctively modern, I think, is not his Copernican heliocentrism, nor his later use of the telescope, Although both of these innovations constitute departures from nearly 2,000 years of astronomical tradition, it's his rejection of uniform circularity which makes him stand out against the backdrop of Ptolemaic astronomy. The question that many historians have asked is, 
why didn't Copernicus reject the axiom of uniform circularity and not just Copernicus? And you know, take your pick of uh, previous astronomers. I believe the answer to this question is fairly self-explanatory. There is a reason why neither Wittich nor Reinhold wrote down any axioms other than the axiom of uniform circularity. For example, an axiom to the effect that the Earth was a stationary center of orbits. You don't find statements like that. Quite plainly, there were no other axioms. Representations and calculations based on uniform circularity define the system by which celestial motions could be modeled, much as the parallel postulate defined the Euclidean system that was used to represent the possible relationships between points, lines, and planes. While astronomers had for centuries experimented with different foci of rotation, it seems they did not make, it did not make sense to them to experiment with varieties of non-circular motion. Uniform circularity was, in fact, never a perfect fit with astronomical data. Each of the Ptolemaic devices, the equant, the epicycle, and so on, uh, was developed and employed to accommodate this persistent problem. Now, Owen Gring Gingrich, who is, I think, one of the greatest historians of astronomy of all time, uh, does not buy the idea that Copernicus was in the vice grip of a conceptual attachment to circles. For him, there's a much simpler, much more scientifically rational explanation for why Copernicus did not abandon circles, uh, namely that it wasn't until Tycho's observations that we had data fine-grained enough to allow us to distinguish between circular and elliptical orbits. Sounds pretty plausible, doesn't it? I'll take it on Professor Gingrich's word that this is in fact the case. I think Professor McGaugh is going to talk about this um, later. Uh, in fact, uh, the problem is that it actually doesn't explain anything because the poor quality of the data cuts both ways. In fact, it just amplifies the puzzle. After all, if our data were not fine-grained enough to distinguish between circles and ellipses, then there would have been nothing to prevent astronomers from using ellipses. In other words, while the new data can explain why Kepler stopped using circles, it cannot explain why no one else did. Kepler was not the first person in history to encounter difficulties modeling astronomical data as uniform circular motion. The entire edifice of pre-modern astronomy is built out of attempts uh, to get around the complications one encounters when adhering to the axiom of uniform circularity. The problem is compounded by the fact that a circle actually is an ellipse with its foci superimposed. Uh, for astronomers before Kepler, there clearly was something special about the circle per se that had nothing to do with its ability to achieve a totally acceptable fit with observation. The long legacy of uniform circularity in astronomy is a compelling illustration of an inference problem that we see across the history of modern science. Namely, how do we know when it is time to throw in the towel and try a new approach? Unfortunately, for Professor Gingrich's tidy tale, this is not something the data can by themselves compel us to do. If they did, the Ptolemaic theory would not have lasted for nearly 2,000 years. Uniform circularity was not, in other words, a uniform success. When astronomers encountered a lack of fit between predictions and observations, they found a way to accommodate the discrepancy within the existing framework. Gingrich's account suggests that anyone in possession of Tycho's data would have, been, would have taken the step that Kepler took, that it was in some sense not that bold of a step. But that would be quite like saying that anyone in possession of Darwin's data would have taken the step he took in concluding that species change over time, a tradition of similar vintage to that of uniform circularity. Lots of people had Darwin's data, and they found ways of fitting it within the research tradition they had inherited. This is what made Darwin's origin such a bold step. Kepler was a tortured mystic with cuckoo ideas. In some instances, particularly at historical moments like the one in which we find Kepler, cuckoo ideas can be more valuable than data. Perhaps most unfortunate for Gingrich's very scientific account is this. Kepler's rejection of uniform circular motion actually occurs in the Mysterium Cosmographicum, written three years before he met Brahe or had access to his data. Convinced that the sun was the cause of orbital motion, and that, like the intensity of light, its motivating power 
decreases inversely with distance, he concludes that a planet's angular velocity will be highest at, highest at its perihelion and lowest at its aphelion. This motivating power is contained in the sun's anima motrix, which Kepler used to make a number of successful predictions. It is to these, the philosophical problems illustrated by these predictions that we now turn. There's a widely held belief that nothing succeeds like success, predictive success. In contrast with mere curve fitting, where we develop a theory that accommodates the data we have, an existing theory's successful predictions seem to dazzle the mind in a way unmatched by anything else in science. It is for this reason that successful predictions are often claimed to be an unmistakable sign of a theory's truth or approximate truth. Indeed, what other explanation could there be? It's no surprise when we successfully fit the curve we're trying to fit, but when our theory makes a successful prediction regarding something no one else had ever thought of, well now, that demands attention. This old saw is unfair both to the practice of curve fitting and to the inferential power of successful predictions. On the one hand, as Kepler's predecessors might have said, curve fitting is not as easy as it looks. Sometimes it takes a genius like Kepler to fit the data in a non-trivial way. On the other hand, successful predictions often come from theories like Kepler's that we now regard as false. The causal role of the anima motrix in Kepler's novel successful predictions is something I'll use now to illustrate a philosophical problem regarding the relationship between a physical theory and the physical world. According to Kepler, the anima motrix is a non-attractive magnetic force emitted from the sun in the form of rays that sort of push the planets around in their orbits. I don't know if he ever drew a diagram of this. I couldn't find one, but I kind of visualize like a, like a big wheel with spokes like coming out. Does that? Oh, is there? Okay. Um, does it look like that? Okay, cool. Uh, <laughs> as mentioned above, this force was thought to vary inversely with distance. So that wasn't, uh, that, this is an idea that's just coming into kind of physical popularity around the turn of the 16th century. Um, and so uh, Gilbert talks about it with respect to magnetism. Um, there's some indication, I take it, that Kepler's ideas about the decreasing power are kind of modeled off of that. Um, and in fact, he takes this to be a sort of magnetic power. Uh, based on this conception of what causes planetary motion, Kepler made a number of successful novel predictions, um, the novelty of which he was aware of and to which he drew attention. They include the following. Number one, the sun spins. Two, it spins in the direction of planetary motion. Three, it spins along the plane of the ecliptic. Four, it spins faster than any of the planets revolve around it. None of these was known at the time Kepler made them. They were inferred later largely on the basis of Fabricius and Galileo's observations of sunspots, which I guess was maybe 15 years later, something like that. Yeah. Why is this an interesting problem? Because the physical ideas to which Kepler appeals in developing these true predictions are, according to current thinking, completely false. There is, as far as we know, not a non-attractive force emanating from the sun and pushing planets around it as it spins. We do not believe that, the planetary, mo that planetary motion would grind to a halt if not for the rotational motion of the sun, as Kepler did. And yet, the novel predictions that he derives from them were correct. The fact that we can derive true predictions from false theories suggests that the inference from a model's predictive success to its physical reality cannot claim universal validity. But how else can we possibly explain the success of Kepler's model? Some will feel the urge to insist that, while false, there's a good reason why Kepler's ideas led directly to true predictions. Could we say that Kepler's theory was functionally equivalent to the Newtonian theory of gravitation in these instances? If that just means has the same consequences as, then it's not very helpful. Lots of theories imply the same data. Were that not the case, we needn't ever wonder whether a successful curve-fitting exercise actually reflected physical reality. 
The pressure to infer theoretical truth from predictive success rises with the accuracy of the successful predictions, because it is here that we feel the non-accidental nature of the success most acutely. The accuracy of quantum mechanics, for example, could not possibly be accidental. No one worth taking seriously would hold such a view. Now, is quantum mechanics the only physical theory that could possibly be this accurate? Likewise, no one worth taking seriously would hold such a view. But it also doesn't matter. We have quantum mechanics, and nothing else works as well as it does. We use it because it works so well. And when we find a theory that works even better, we will use that one instead. The relationship between a physical theory and the physical world is one that only becomes a central preoccupation of scientific inquiry after Kepler. Uh, it is part of the all-encompassing transition we know as a scientific revolution. It remains of interest to philosophers of science because of the way it, like the stopping problem, seems to pull inexorably in the direction of a conclusion that one cannot in good conscience, good conscience accept. <clears throat> Intuitively, we want there to be an evidentiary threshold beyond which it would be unscientific to continue to adhere to a theory. Logically and historically, we know that there is no such threshold. Intuitively, we assume that a sufficiently predictively successful theory must be true in some literal sense. Logically, we know that this inference is faulty. The, this gap between intuition and logic is the fuel that drives both philosophical and scientific reflection. Thanks. I just was wondering if you could say a little bit more about, because you were talking about like, um, you know, the fact that that um, curve, the ability to fit data that you already have is not necessarily good evidence for the validity of the theory, and neither is the ability to, <clears throat> to test predictions. Um, but it, it seems like in both cases in the, in the you know, <clears throat> epicycles, we're able to fit the data. Ellipses were also able to fit the data. You just needed more epicycles, you know. So, um, can you say a little bit more about, from a philosophical perspective, like how do you decide based on? I mean, it seems that, you know, one was a simpler sort of explanation, one was more complex. Does that lend some weight to choosing which one is more likely to be true? Yeah, so, so the, the simpler one presumably is the single ellipse model. Yeah. Well, I mean, so. The Ptolemaics thought their model was simpler because of the uniformity, rotational symmetry of a circle uh, versus an ellipse. And, um, you know, you see in, you know, there are philosophers, historians of science like, like studying these really extraordinary periods in the history of science because you always see people appealing to things like this, right? Um, uh, values uh, that theories are supposed to embody, good theories are supposed to embody. And you, you very frequently find that both sides are claiming the same value in virtue of their theory. Um, and, you know, I mean, I think in that, this particular case, there's a certain justice to that. I mean, a circle, I mean, it's, it's a degenerate case of, a, of an ellipse, but it's also simpler in a, in a sense of, you know, calculation. Um, although, I mean, once you have like 50 epicycles, it doesn't, it's not simple anymore. But, right, I mean, I, so, you know, I think that, say, when, when Gingrich criticizes the idea that circles appealed for so long because of some metaphysical um, attachment to them, I, I think that, you know, even if we are on board with that, there are still reasons to prefer circles that are not metaphysical, but that do view them as embodying a certain set of values that we want. Um, and yeah, I mean, you don't often, at least I don't often see 
appeals to values settling scientific disputes. Um, and in, in very extraordinary cases like this, um, you often don't see appeals to data settling scientific disputes either. It's just kind of, we find a framework that we like, that works, it's adequate, and we're gonna go with it because we can use it. Um, I don't know, does that make sense? Yeah, okay. Okay, well, it seems people have heard that I don't respond well to criticism, and uh, I will sit down now. Thank you. That was great, Chris, thanks. Uh, so I'm Stacy McGaw, uh, I'm the token astronomer here. Um, and I, I must say I am in awe of my colleagues who had prepared notes. I don't know what I'm gonna say until I say it. Um, and so um, in that spirit of preparedness, um, <laughs> when Professor Rothman asked me for a title, I gave the first thing that came up to the top of my head because I, I wasn't gonna think about this yet. Um, and so along the top there, I've sort of put a more um, perhaps musically connected idea, the cosmic harmonies uh, amongst both the planets and the galaxies. Because one of the things that resonates with our minds, whether we want to put this in terms of a theory uh, or any of the issues that Professor Halfa was just discussing, uh, things that grab our minds are patterns in nature. Um, and so this is something that, that Kepler came upon and, and cast an entirely new light on. Uh, and it's an ongoing process. Uh, so, how do I advance this? Is this guy here? Okay. All right, so uh, I was lucky enough to be in Prague uh, shortly before the pandemic, so this is a uh, statue uh, of Tycho and uh, Kepler in front of the Kepler Gymnasium there. Uh, and um, these two had an interesting relationship, uh, and I show this largely because nothing happens in a vacuum, even though Kepler clearly did bit, burn the midnight oil and did do a lot of things just on his own gumption. Um, and, you know, I would say, to, to sum it up crudely, Kepler was the brains and Tycho was the ego of this team. Um, and he was responsible for doing a lot of essential things. He was, of course, brilliant in his own right and an extraordinarily skilled observer and uh, I only learned today that it's supposed to be pronounced Tycho. Um, it's always Tycho to me. Um, um, but so he built this elaborate uh, observatory on uh, uh, the island of Uraniborg, basically as near as I can tell uh, by virtue of moving his jaw and convincing the, the uh, royalty to fund him. Uh, and he uh, spared no expense uh, of uh, the royal purse in not just building an elaborate uh, and scientifically useful large uh, observatory, but also hiring an elaborate staff of artisans and people to build instruments uh, that were useful, uh, and eventually brought Kepler on uh, as the sort of the mathematician to, to do the hard grinding. Um, so uh, in this depiction here, which you see a lot, he's pointing at that little slit in the wall. And so an important uh, method of measuring positions on the sky was transit. And basically, you would watch when a star or a planet transited through a certain position. And uh, he, by building this large observatory, he was able to measure those angles very precisely. Of course, the sky rises and sets every day. Uh, and the stars remain in a fixed pattern as they do so, and the planets move relative to the stars. And so in this fashion, he was able to obtain really accurate data which were essential to uh, Kepler's realization. Uh, so the three laws for which he's uh, famous, uh, the orbit of each planet is an ellipse with the sun at one focus, uh, that really was the mind-blowing one. That, as Professor Hoffa just emphasized, for whatever reasons, people were obsessed with circular motion in the heavens. That was what was supposed to happen. And so to step outside of that, uh, and to say, well, maybe it's a different shape, uh, was really, I think, as important as uh, Copernicus's contributions to putting things 
uh, at the, uh, putting the sun at the center of the, uh, the solar system. Um, now, I want to emphasize how important it was to have good data. Uh, so what it was he was actually doing, and I've emphasized the, uh, the quotes, which, you know, people used a lot of words back then. Um, <laughs> we're not very patient with that. Um, but the, the essential thing is that um, if I thought I could ignore these eight minutes of arc, then I would have just patched up my hypothesis, right? I could have made everything work. And this is what we're always doing in science. We don't want to go to that next step of completely adopting a new framework and abandoning the old one, unless there's something really compelling making us do so. And so this was for him the thing that said, no, I got to think outside the box. Why others didn't do that is a really good question. Um, but it is a subtle effect. So you see the image. Uh, over here is a, a circle. There's a blue line there. It's a perfect circle. Uh, a green line is the uh, closest match. Uh, no, it's, it's not a match at all. It's an ellipse uh, with an eccentricity of 0.2. Uh, but it's a very good match to the blue line, right? Your eye can barely see the difference. Uh, and that's a big effect. Uh, Mars, which is, uh, aside from Mercury, the most eccentric of the planets, and certainly the one he had the best data for, uh, it's uh, less than uh, half of that in its eccentricity. So that meant that it was off by eight arc minutes from what he could do. Um, doop, 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 doop. Word, my, oh, there's that diagram. Um, what, what he could predict using uh, any of the existing systems. And so this is one of his attempts uh, to do so. And you see all these loop-de-loops. Uh, every loop-de-loop -loop uh, corresponds to one of the uh, retrograde motion periods, right? So around the uh, uh, edges are marked the constellations of the ecliptic, uh, the zodiac. All the uh, planets are moving in that uh, same plane in the sky. And you mark their locations relative to the background pattern of stars. And so much like his uh, triangle, uh, diagram that Professor Rothman showed us. Um, he's basically traced out what the path needs to be, uh, and this is in a geocentric system with the whole epicycles and also the equants. And it wasn't the epicycle that Copernicus objected to, it was the equants, wherein you had not just circular motion, but the center of the circle was offset, right? And that, even learning that much, kind of blew my mind because when I was a young physics student, I was taught that epicycles were bad because they were a complication. And that's obviously true if you pile like epicycle and epicycle and epicycle. And there did come a phase around here when, after over a thousand years, Ptolemy was starting to get things wrong. And that's a pretty fabulously successfully predictive theory. Um, but by then, you were starting to have to make minor corrections and add little epicycles on top of the big epicycles. And then at some point, you are chasing your tail. And how do you know when that's come to be? Um, but people at the time were saying, oh, I've discovered a new epicycle in the orbit of whatever. And that's, that's just silly to our, our modern uh, way of thinking. Uh, but so Kepler made this calculation. And so the position at any planet, oh, I just can't stay. finish, right? So uh, this is not just the, the path that it takes, but as a function of time. So you can imagine drawing a line that intersects uh, as a tangent on any date, uh, one of those curves, and finding where the planet is predicted to be. And so this is what calculation Kepler had to make uh, to, to test this. And he found a discrepancy of this eight arc minutes an arc minute is 1 60th of a degree. This is a tiny thing. And that um, was uh, just under the precision that uh, Ptolemy was able to do. Uh, much like um, you know, the geocentric system would have died uh, immediately if Venus had a larger angular size, because then we could see its phases with our eyeballs. And we could see it went through the full range of phases, not just always being a crescent phase, because it's between us and the uh, sun. Uh, and it's close. The resolution of our eyes is not quite good enough. So maybe eagles have known this for a long time and <laughs> took us a long time to figure it out. But there's this al also this notion of this obsession with circular motion, uh, which, uh, again, 
to our modern mind, looking back, the circle is just a special case of an ellipse, and all these conic sections are possible things, a parabola being the over-under point between something that's uh, gravitationally bound and unbound, and a hyperbola being something that passes by, like, you know, if something comes from interstellar space and swings through the solar system and by the sun, it'll get bent in its path in a hyper hyperbolic path. So in some sense, this is a generalization, and the circle's just a special case, and that can be just as uh, beautiful and compelling to our minds. But we've turned it entirely upside down. Uh, so uh, it took him almost a decade to get to the uh, third law, uh, the, the square of the sidereal periods uh, scaled as a third power of the semi-major axes, the size of the ellipses. Uh, and I really do imagine him just, you know, we, he didn't have calculators and stuff like we did. He had to grind all this out by hand late at night. And how many times, well, one power doesn't work. Let's try squaring it. Well, squaring it, well, how about cubing? I mean, <laughs> it's no wonder it took him a long time to get there. It's hard grinding work to do that. Um, and so you know, on the, the left-hand diagram is just that plot. If you plot the square of the period uh, against the cube of the semi-major axis, you get a straight line, all the planets fall on. And that, again, is something that's a, a harmony, right? That's something that compels you, that grabs your mind, that there is this pattern. You're not just all over the place. Um, and, and I should say, too, he had to have uh, the Coper Copernican worldview in mind to even think about this period, because this is a sidereal period. That's not what's observed. Uh, what's observed is a synodic period. When does a planet return to the same part of the sky for opposition to opposition or conjunction to conjunction or something like that? And that, of course, is a convolution not of this, the planet's period, but also of the Earth's, where we're viewing it from. So most uh, planets have a, per a synodic period about the period of a year, because it's dominated by where we're standing, not what it's doing. So you have to have a framework that lets you convert that to the true period of the thing going around independently of the Earth. So that's already a huge conceptual leap. Uh, on the right is the same plot, uh, but cast in terms of a rotation curve, uh, the velocity with which uh, a planet is orbiting uh, as a function of its distance from the sun. Of course, the orbits are nearly circular enough that this looks almost like a perfect line, though of course it's not as good a way of looking at it in the sense that the velocities do vary uh, near perigee and apogee. Uh, but I do that uh, to make uh, an analogy to galaxies, which I study, uh, and that's zooming out now by a factor of 100 million. So from the solar system where we're talking about uh, scales of astronomical units uh, out to the uh, side of the galaxy, we're, we're talking about thousands of uh, parsecs or, or light years. Uh, and th the remarkable thing about galaxies is that they are not Keplerian. Those rotation curves do not fall off as the way that you saw for the solar system. They are flat, and of course, this was famously discovered uh, by Vera Rubin, uh, a number of other people, but Vera really uh, advocated and pushed for this and measuring it over and over. She told me the story of uh, measuring this for Andromeda, which is the nearest bright galaxy to us, and uh, having Alan Sandage, a, a very eminent uh, cosmologist at the time, dismiss it and say, oh, that's just the effects of looking at a bright galaxy. And she's like, what? Because it, it made no sense. That comment made no sense whatsoever. Uh, but it was just, you know, that's not right. That is our reaction to hearing something not right. So here you see uh, many examples where she measured out, went and out, and over and over. And this is just one of a series of papers she wrote at the time showing it. In 100 cases, it was always flat. So there's a, a picture of uh, Vera with her husband, Bob with the uh, Magellan Telescope in the background uh, in uh, Chile. Now, I think it was still under construction at the time. In, in fact, it had to have been, because I haven't been back there since. Um, and so I'm sure people will speak uh, in the future about her the same way we do about Kepler now, because this is really uh, uh, changes our worldview in profound ways. Uh, and so this is the, the quantitative look at that. You can calculate from using all the mechanics of Newton and everything that was learned post-Kepler. Uh, but it still comes down to that same shape, that it depends on the mass of the object and how far away you get. And you can predict what that looks like, and that's that black line falling down. That's what we call the expected Keplerian behavior. If what you saw was what you'd get, that's what the rotation curve of this galaxy should be. Uh, that 
uh, upper line that goes through all the data, that's what we see. All right. So galaxies do not behave in a Keplerian fashion. Um, and so the interpretation of this uh, is to add two Keplerian components, that the galaxy is embedded in a larger uh, halo of invisible mass that we call dark matter. And so that blue line that is the total is the combination of the declining luminous matter and the increasing contribution of the dark matter, which has both a bigger mass and a bigger scale radius. And they, you know, you have to arrange it so that they contribute enough to keep things flat, just so. Now, that was well known when I entered the field, as was this thing called the Tolley-Fisher relation. Uh, but it took a while to put things together. And in a nutshell, uh, the amplitude of the speed, how fast a galaxy spins, depends on its mass, the mass of the stuff you can see. Uh, and that's what this Tolley-Fisher relation tells you. So the flat rotation speed is really big for a really big galaxy uh, and small for a small galaxy. Uh, and so you can plot that together. So there's the mass on the y-axis and the rotation speed on the x-axis. And every point there is a galaxy. Um, and I was interested in these dwarf galaxies that are more gas than stars. So the lighter blue points are things that are more gas than our, our stars. Um, and the blue, darker blue are more stars. And, and if you count all those components, you add everything up, then you get just this one power law. Um, but what you don't understand is why there is no residual size, right? It's uh, the mass over the radius should give you the velocity. Uh, and so I had a prediction for these low surface brightness things I was working on uh, that had larger radii for the same mass. And uh, they should have deviated from this Tolley Fisher relation, as it was known at the time. And that's what that red dotted line there is in the residuals. I was wrong, right? The data do not do that. That was my prediction. And it's not really my prediction. It's Newton's and Kepler's, right? And so uh, the only recourse in this picture is to um, basically play a fine tuning game to balance uh, what the distribution of the stuff you see uh, is doing against the distribution of the stuff that you can't see is doing. And of course, you're free to do that. This is a curve fitting exercise because you can't see that one component. So you're free to do that, and it always works. Uh, but there's something more to it. And so I've plotted here all the rotation curves I could put my hands to, uh, color coded by the effective surface brightness. That just is a measure of how concentrated the stars are. High surface brightness, the stars are relatively close together. Low surface brightness, they're spread apart. Okay? Uh, and you can see there's almost a perfect rainbow here. Right, that the low surface brightness galaxies have slowly rising rotation curves tend to have lower amplitudes. And uh, as you get to higher and higher surface brightness galaxies, they go up more and more quickly. This is an example of the harmonies I'm talking about. There's a clear pattern here that you can see with your eyes. You don't need any framework, mathematical or otherwise, to see that there's something systematic going on. That tells us something about how the universe works. You can argue forever about what that means but it's telling us something. Uh, and so it's a pattern that's different than the pattern that Kepler discovered. Um, this is uh, what I call the radial acceleration relation. And so now we're plotting the centripetal acceleration that's observed. So sort of the force that's required to keep a star in its orbit. Plotted against what's predicted by the whole uh, mechanics of Newtonian dynamics. And if there were no dark matter or whatever funny business is going on, then everything would be on the straight line. That's the prediction of, of Newton and, and Kepler, really. Um, but you can see there's a deviation from that. The data, as you go to low acceleration, uh, bend upwards. And that difference is entirely what we call dark matter. But it's connected to the distribution of luminous matter. We can calculate it just based on what we see. Uh, and so this is a pattern. This is some kind of harmony, and there's a new scale here that's unknown to physics before. It's basically an acceleration scale that's somehow special to galaxies. Now, that's just in the data. Uh, and so we can zoom out. This is the same plot now, but covering a much larger range so that I can encompass the solar system. 
where um, Kepler, you can see the planets in this font all follow that straight line. That straight line is what's predicted by Newtonian gravity. Going all the way up to the top, you are here where you feel about 10 meters per second per second sitting in this room. Right? And then as you go out in the solar system, the uh, forces that the planets feel get less and less as they get further and further to the sun because of the famous inverse square law. Uh, but when you get to the scale of uh, this new number, you bend away from that one-to-one -one relation, and that's where galaxies live. And they follow this new relation. So there is an extension of this harmony, and they're connected in some way. And it is our job as theorists to try to understand what that is. Thank you. Thanks, that was awesome. Um, do you have any, I mean, just uh, in your personal experience, so you see Kepler kind of grappling with the problem of what to do with my platonic solid uh, model, because it doesn't seem to be fitting right. I mean, do you have like a, a articulatable sense of what you kind of go through when you're looking at gaps between prediction and observations? Pain. <laughs> um, so, so, I mean, the sort of story of how I personally got onto this involves that failed prediction. Um, so, I thought I was on to a way of understanding low surface brightness galaxies, which I had been working on at that time, and that was my personal obsession. And up until that point, it had been largely uh, ignored in the field. Um, and in fact, there was a thing called Freeman's Law at the time that asserted they didn't even exist. Um, and um, so, you know, one thing was demonstrating they exist, but the other thing is measuring their properties and, and trying to learn from that. And that made a great test of uh, galaxy formation theories at the time, because they had mostly been tuned to explain Freeman's Law, things that we exist. Here, okay, here's this new kind of thing that you weren't really thinking about. So it pushed the theory into a regime that it wasn't designed to cope with. They all failed, including mine. So what I had learned, and of course it's an iterative process, so what I had learned up until that point about low surface brightness galaxies told me that they were just diffuse systems. Everything about their uh, properties were because the stars were more spread out. They made them slower. They evolved more slowly. Um, and that led me to two predictions that were genuine a priori predictions that could be tested. One, they uh, will have that property if they form later. Uh, and then there'll be lower density just because the collapse time takes longer and that's how the dynamics works. Um, in which case they should be distributed more diffusely than regular galaxies. So if you imagine, if you've seen the pictures of large scale structure of the universe, these very filamentary structures, um, they should follow that but not as tightly. Um, and I didn't know how to measure that, but by good chance an office mate of mine in Cambridge where I was a postdoc at the time did, and we got to talking about this, and I was like, well, this is the obvious consequence, but I don't know how to measure it. He's like, oh, I know how to measure that, and so we did it, and it was bang on. Um, and that was not a quantitative prediction, it was sort of, you know, it had to shift in that way, and that's what we saw, and so I was very full of myself at that point. We got this. The second prediction was that there's a lower density for the same mass you're spread over a larger radius, that means the velocity has to be lower. And so they should shift off of Tully Fisher. Well, no. <laughs> so I really spent a lot of time saying, well, how could this be? Um, and I made up all sorts of, you know, exactly as you described, you, you, you just um, go in circles trying to accommodate that. Um, and I found lots of ways to do it, but none of them that I found to be satisfactory uh, because it, it always seemed that I was invoking a tautology. Oh, this does it. Oh, well, but wait, I assumed that when I built this particular model, and that has the necessary consequence. Mm -hmm. And frankly, the history of the field since then is people reproducing those tautologies without recognizing that's what they're doing. Because <laughs> it's the desired answer. It's within the framework that we currently have. You need to do something like that without, in, if you don't want to abandon the framework, which nobody wants to do. I'd like to ask kind of a related question, which is like sort of this, you know, open questions about why do we see these deviations? And of course, some people attribute it to dark matter, others to modified gravity. Um, I was wondering, what, what do you see? What would be the thing that 
could resolve that and convince everyone one way or the other? Well, that's a great question that I've been asking myself for over 20 years now. And um, the first answer I came up with, because uh, for, the, for the home audience, um, there are really uh, two rather different uh, ways that you get into the dark matter problem. One is the dynamics of galaxies and other extragalactic systems that I talked about. The other is cosmology writ large. Einstein's general relativity provides a really good description of how the universe evolves uh, and expands over time. And that works now if and only if you have dark matter and also dark energy, right? And so if you assume that, if you start out with that blinder on that it has to be that, then you are inexorably driven to conclude that those things are too. So from that perspective, this is just all details to be worked out. Um, from my perspective, this is a fundamental cosmic harmony that should be driving. There's, there's clearly one force law at work in galaxies, just as um, Kepler's law led Newton to realize there was one force law working in the solar system. And the thing that troubles me is that you know, if we're going to say we explain that with dark matter, it's like saying, well, we can explain the solar system with an inverse cube law. There just happens to be dark matter distributed just so that it always looks like an inverse square law, right? And that's, that's insane to our way of thinking. But that's exactly what we are doing with dark matter and galaxies right now. Um, but, uh, you know, <sighs> I would make this argument to cosmologists, and they cared not one whit about, oh, galaxies are small. I don't know, 100,000 light years strikes me as kind of big. Uh, but, but to the mind of a cosmologist, that's small. And it's small scales are nonlinear, and so any, anything goes, basically. And, and, and they're uh, obsessed with uh, being able to solve uh, linear perturbation theories on large scales, where everything is just yar and clean and very simple. Um, and of course, it's the other way around. Once you adopt a modified gravity solution, it's galaxies that are simple because it's just centripetal motion in the force law, and you don't even have a theory that addresses cosmology. Right? So it's very hard to switch hats and think about it fairly both ways. Um, so my first thought was how to explain that was to make a prediction for the microwave background. That came true, uh, and nobody cared. Uh, or else maybe they did care because I've only recently become aware that, that there's this sort of background chatter as to how that didn't even happen. Um, <laughs> they didn't bother to read the papers or the numbers. They just said, oh, well, that was wrong. Um, and so I, I still wonder, how do we get out of this? And it's, it's tough because you appeal to arguments. You appeal to the philosophy of science, to, uh, you know, uh, the, the rule of parsimony. And none of, you know, both sides will claim this. Um, so, so just to give one more definitive answer, um, right now the limits on neutrino mass um, from you know atmospheric oscillations, you have to have at least 0 0.06 eV in the sum of the three neutrino masses, uh, just to have those space for the levels in the neutrino hierarchy. Um, on the other hand, if you have too much mass in a hot dark matter component, then it really messes up our standard picture of the structure formation, that is the linear theory that cosmologists are so happy about. And so the limit on that side is an upper limit of 0.12 eV. Uh, so there's only that narrow factor of two window in which the neutrino mass has to reside, the sum of the neutrino masses. Um, well, experimentally, we're still up around one electron volt. So if uh, some experiment like Katrine actually measured it was one or half an EV or clearly above that 0.12, then I think that would be uh, a definitive sign. Uh, but if it's not that, then we're still just left arguing about which is better, right? Um, in the previous talk, uh, Professor Hoffa mentioned that in like these kind of disputes between uh, theory that's more accepted and more um, maybe has more of a history and a new theory that's come along, oftentimes both sides claim um, the same value in virtue of their theories. Do you see anything like that with um, dark matter or modified gravity? Well, so in this case, I do put a lot of weight on a priori prediction. And so I just bragged about how I got one prediction right, but also admitted how I got one wrong. Um, everything I just showed you, though I didn't mention it, was predicted by a modified gravity theory 
that Milgram wrote down in 1983. Um, and at the time, people didn't think low surface brightness galaxies existed. But he said explicitly that they would be on the same tolly fish relation. He said explicitly they would have the kind of rotation curve shapes that we do. And that does uh, appeal to my mind. It, he, you know, he could write it down, nerding out all on his own. He wrote down this uh, set of predictions, and they came true. That has to mean something. Now, I'm open to it meaning something more than that. His theory is not complete in the sense that we're used to meaning that. But I would also think that any sensible approach would start from there and build on that. And that's not what we're doing. We're saying, no, we are already committed to dark matter, and so we're going to keep adding our epicycles there until it works out. And we can do that um, because you're, you have literal, it really is an epicyclic theory. You have an infinite number of free parameters to play with because you can't see this stuff. I find that very unsatisfactory. Okay, well, I think my dear colleague uh, from physics, uh, Harsh Matur, is up next. Um, I'm really excited to hear what he has to say about this. Thank you. Right, so um, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for this wonderful event, and especially Aviva uh, for inviting me to talk here. And we've had some great conversations about Kepler, and we hope to continue, continue those as a result of this symposium. Um, let's see if I can figure out how to make this advance. Yes, it's working, okay. And I guess Stacy's already remarked on the fact that we have sort of two cultures on the sides, of, uh, two sides of Euclid Avenue, and it's really you know awesome to see the humanists with their uh, beautifully written papers. And uh, but you know, uh, on our side of Euclid Avenue, uh, we sort of mumble at the board, and so I'm afraid I'm afraid that's what you're going to get here. Um, uh, but in any case, uh, let's plunge into the story. So what I want to do is I want to talk about Kepler's scientific legacy and his really enduring scientific legacy. And there's a number of ways you can approach that uh, subject. You could talk about his minor works, actually, as a great way to, or what I called his minor works as a way of approaching that. Um, because, for example, he had this mathematical conjecture about how to stack up cannonballs. And that was proved only in the 1990s, uh, truly an enduring problem. And then there's the relatively new field of pattern formation which regards Kepler and his snowflake as kind of the beginning of it all. Um, he was also a pioneer of science fiction, as we heard this morning. Um, uh, but what I'm going to focus on is his major work, uh, which is planetary motion. So uh, in this part of the talk, um, I'm going to delve a little bit into the book we are here celebrating. And uh, it's just amazing to have it right here. Um, so, so this book, as well as uh, two other books uh, that were part of his major works that you've also heard a little bit about already. Um, so first, let me start by paraphrasing Kepler's laws as we learn them in an introductory physics course. Uh, and I should also say that there are a, a few equations in my talk as we go along. But if you don't like equations, that's OK. There's a sort of essential irreducible message which, which you will get, so don't tune out. Um, uh, It'll pass. Um, <laughs> but I did want the equations up there for people who might want to know in a little more detail what I'm saying. Um, so, so the laws of Kepler, um, as, uh, as we introduced them in introductory physics, are that planets move along elliptical orbits. And an ellipse is just a slightly flattened circle. And it's got these two foci. And the sun sits at one of those foci. So it's, uh, it's characterized by two parameters, the major axis. Uh, which is basically the size of the ellipse. Uh, that's A, denoted A. And the other important parameter of an ellipse is the eccentricity, which tells you what the shape of the ellipse is. It basically measures how far apart these foci are. So if the eccentricity is zero, it's a circle. But as the eccentricity grows, it becomes more and more squished, the ellipse. So shape and size, that's what uh, describes an ellipse. Um, the second law of Kepler is the law of areas, which just says that if you imagine there's a line connecting the sun to the planet, then when the planet moves, maybe counterclockwise in this picture, uh, this line is going to trace out some area. And the rate at which it traces out area um, is constant. Or uh, to put it more simply, uh, the planet moves faster when it's close to the sun and slower when it goes farther away. 
and that's a way of quantifying it. Okay, then the third law of Kepler is the harmonic law, and that basically says that the bigger the orbit is, the farther the planet is from the sun, um, the longer it takes to go around, and there's a precise mathematical relationship which Kepler uh, found through back-breaking back labor uh, to be that t is proportional to a to the 3 half the power, and I, here I show some new data which confirms that, uh, or the best data that we have today, totally lining up with that within the solar system. Okay, and then finally, uh, so those are the things that we usually emphasize in introductory physics and mechanics courses. Uh, there's another really important contribution of Kepler, which somehow doesn't quite get the same amount of um, airtime, but it should, especially in upper-level physics courses, um, which is that it's all very well to know that the orbit is an ellipse, but if you want to say where on the ellipse the planet is, you, I mean, that's also a quantity of interest. And there's two ways you can specify where on the orbit the planet is. One is just by giving the angle uh, which is shown as F in that figure over there. F is the angle between the perihelion, the place where the planet is closest to the sun, and its actual current location. So that's called the true anomaly, and that's one way you can say where the planet is. But then there's also this quantity called the eccentric anomaly, um, which is a little bit more complicated. The way it works is that you draw a circle, uh, which is what that outer loop is over there in my drawing. Uh, you draw a circle which has the same diameter as the major axis of the ellipse and then you project upward, and the angle that you now get, that's, uh, and actually, I'm sorry, I made that line wrong. That, that angle is, should come from the center of the ellipse, not from the location of the sun. Uh, that's called the eccentric anomaly. Sorry, that was made very late last night. Uh, <laughs> I think it shows. <laughs> um, OK, um, but anyway, so, so the takeaway here is that the eccentric anomaly and the uh, true anomaly, they're just two ways of characterizing where the planet is around the orbit. Um, and the thing is that the eccentric anomaly is the thing that's easy to calculate. There's a simple formula for it which Kepler discovered. So m over there represents what the angle f would be if the planet was moving at a constant angular velocity around the sun. So, so that's nice and easy. Oh, probably not near the book. Uh, <laughs> I'm just going to put it on a flatter surface, but that's probably the last thing you want me to do. Oh, there's a shelf. Okay, very good. Yes. Ah, thank you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Right. Um, okay, so m is the angle that you would have got if it was moving at a uniform angular velocity. Um, and then you can calculate the eccentric anomaly using that equation. Very easy to do on a pocket calculator, but back-breaking labor for Kepler to solve that equation. But it's nice that there's an equation, and that's what I want you to take away. All right, so that's how we would describe um, Kepler's laws today um, in, say, a mechanics course. Um, but how did Kepler describe them? I think it's sort of interesting for a modern reader to see, look, look into that. And here's this picture of Kepler, which actually might not be Kepler. I mean, we're not absolutely 100% sure that this is him. Uh, but it's either him or one of his contemporaries. Um, and, and here's what he says in the, uh, the Epitome of Copernican Astronomy, which is written in the form of um, questions and answers, as Aviva mentioned this morning. Or I guess if it had been written today, it might have been called Frequently Asked Questions about Copernican Astronomy. Um, if you look into this book, um, you know, at first it's, it's actually, it seems very relatable, uh, very contemporary. Uh, for example, uh, you know, he has this preface where he says that uh, his previous book, Commentaries uh, on the Movement of the Planet Mars, uh, it was, uh, you know, it sort of buried all the good stuff in thickets of calculation and also... Um, you know, the more delicate readers might have been scared off by the price of the book, and so, so he's decided to. So it just reads, reads, reads like a contemporary preface, and that's the reason why he's writing this book, The Epitome of, Contemporary, oh, of Copernican Astronomy. Um, but then within this book, uh, and then when you look within this book, you do find Kepler's three laws. Uh, they're a little bit buried, and maybe I won't read through all of it, but I just wanted to get the impression that, um, you know, it is really in this question-answer format, and if you look, you begin to find, um, you do find all the three laws. Um, so there's, uh, in book four, uh, you find the harmonic law um, in, answered in response to a question. In book five, um, you uh, find the law of ellipses, which is not stated in a very catchy way where I could pull a quote uh, from it, but in the course of a few wordy paragraphs, I think Stacy alluded to the fact that they were more wordy back then than, uh, than we are now in physics and astronomy. Um, but he, uh, in response to this question, he ultimately divulges that they are ellipses and uh, with the sun at the focus. And then you find also the, uh, the uh, area law um, stated as well. Again, not in a catchy way that I could pull as a short quote, but there's a section 
um, uh, over here with the section header I've uh, provided you. Um, and then you find the anomaly equation as well, um, and uh, that's in response to a question asking how do you work out the anomaly, and the answer is you use the anomaly equation, uh, which he presents uh, in the form of an example. Um, so it's all there, and that's great, but what, what you find as a modern reader going through this book is that it's buried, really, it, not in thickets of calculation, which is fine, uh, fine by me, but it's buried in thickets of questions and speculations along these lines. Um, well, you can read that question for yourself. Um, but, uh, you know, so at this point you might think, okay, so this isn't really science. He was just some kind of transitional figure, as I think we heard him uh, described earlier. But in fact, um, uh, I guess I'd like to delve a little bit more into this question that he raises over here. Uh, first of all, I want to point out, uh, as others have done also, that this was very much uh, of the times, the notion that there's somehow music associated with the movement uh, of the stars and planets, as you find in uh, this quote from Shakespeare as well, uh, which is actually exactly contemporaneous with the first edition of this book. Um, but, um, uh, but really hidden behind uh, that question that Kepler was asking about uh, how, how, which, which planet is which singer, uh, hidden behind that um, are, are these two questions. Why are there six planets? And what is the explanation for the sizes and shapes of their orbits? Okay. Now these we realize, know today are completely misguided questions. Uh, there's nothing inevitable about the shapes and sizes of the planet's orbits. And there's nothing inevitable about the fact that there are six planets. It could have been completely different. But we have the benefit of hindsight, so it's really not at all unreasonable of Kepler to have asked these questions at the time. And uh, for comparison, uh, so this is actually a constant struggle in science, trying to figure out what are the questions we're allowed to ask, what questions actually have meaningful answers. And so here I've put up some problems of particle physics, which uh, particle physicists are constantly preoccupied with, um, such as why are the masses of the elementary particles so small? Why do they have the values that they do? Why is gravity so weak compared to the other forces that Jesse was telling us about this morning? Um, why is the cosmological constant so small? This is the thing that determines the accelerating expansion of the universe. Or why does space appear to be three-dimensional? And the fact is that um, when we do find the answers to these questions, they may not be what we expect. And uh, they may not take the form that we expect, and these questions may uh, well, we'll have to see what happens. Um, so, so in other words, there was nothing wrong with Kepler asking those questions um, at, at the time. Um, also, he was guided by geometry and musical harmony and so on. Uh, well, so are modern physicists. I mean, uh, some of the guiding principles that are explicitly cited are symmetry and naturalness, which actually have a precise mathematical meaning, but also beauty. There's this quote by Dirac that physical laws must have mathematical beauty. Um, so, so in some ways, uh, things, you know, things are really not that different. Um, okay, so, so now uh, on, to, on to the book. Um, so, so we heard uh, again this morning from Aviva, but for people who weren't here perhaps, um, uh, uh, in this book, uh, one of the main, main hypotheses that Kepler put forward, uh, one of his big ideas over here was that you could understand the relative sizes of planetary orbits by, from the platonic solids. You sort of put the platonic solids so one inside the other, and then um, from the size of a sphere that you can circumscribe the solid with or inscribe within the solid, uh, and the six spheres you can put inside five, you know, inside and outside five solids, that explains why there are six planets. And you can also get the sizes more or less right. But it's not exactly right, and Kepler was really, uh, you know, really details oriented, so, so he realized it wasn't exactly right. Um, but he was happy that he got six planets out of this. Um, but later on, he also realized that the orbits are not circular, so it's not just a matter of predicting the size. You must also explain the shape. And so that's where um, the idea of consonants came in, uh, of, of uh, musical harmonies came in, in the book, The Harmonies of the World. Uh, and so he began to consider quantities like this. Uh, he looked at a given planet, and he looked at um, when it was moving fastest, when it's close to the sun, and when it's moving slowest, when it's far from the sun. And he would take the ratio of those angular velocities, um, or, or, yeah, those angular velocities. And here's a nice problem for the physics students in the audience. Uh, you can show that that ratio is um, related to the shape of the orbit, to the eccentricity by the formula I've provided over there. Um, so, um, so what he did was he calculated what these uh, ratios were. And what he found is that they're pretty close to these uh, integer ratios. Uh, for example, for Saturn, it's um, 
four, four, four to five. And that ratio of frequencies in music theory of the day, or, or for that matter today as well, um, it's, it's, it's an important interval in music, and it's a consonant interval. And so this was Kepler, another aha moment for Kepler. He, he thought that if, there, if these ratios come out to be integers that are particularly favored in music, um, then maybe those orbit shapes would also be favored by nature. Uh, that was his idea. Um, of course, it's completely wrong, but uh, th th that was the idea in a nutshell. Now, the strange thing is that there's an echo of that idea um, that has reappeared in the 20th century um, in quantum mechanics. So I want to move forward uh, about 300 years now and look at this atom as we understood it in the early 20th century. Um, and what was realized at the time was that it was like a miniature solar system. Uh, if you look at the simplest atom, hydrogen, then the proton is kind of like uh, the sun at the center of the system, and the electron is like a planet going around, this, uh, around, around the nucleus, or the proton. And uh, gravi uh, gravity is replaced by electrical forces, which have exactly the same behavior. They have the inverse square fall off with distance. So in fact, you get exactly the kind of motion. Um, in fact, electrons would obey Kepler's laws, all, all three of the laws, all of the laws, including the anomaly equation. Um, it's the same equations, uh, same solutions. And then um, here, here's the remarkable thing. If you look at the spectra of um, atoms, like for example, hydrogen over there, when you make hydrogen into a vapor and it glows, it gives off very specific frequencies. And each atom has its own characteristic frequencies, but it doesn't give a continuous spectrum like you see in the lower picture, which is um, a more dense body. It's actually the entire sun, and it's glowing. And that gives off a complete spectrum. But if you're looking at individual atoms radiating, they really have these preferred frequencies. And so the way this was understood um, in the early 20th century by people like Bohr and Sommerfeld was that this implied that, um, or maybe I should stay on this slide for a minute. Uh, what this implied was that orbits, these orbits uh, in an atom, couldn't be just any shape or size whatsoever, uh, as they can be in the solar system. They had to be particular shapes and sizes. They were quantized. Um, and so what they found, and Kepler would have loved this, what they found is that the orbits could be labeled by two integers. Kepler loved whole number ratios, and here they are, two whole numbers um, called the principal and angular, mo angular momentum quantum number. And the size of the orbits is given by the first formula. This is not actually how Bohr and Sommerfeld expressed the quantization rules, but you can rework them into a form that Kepler would have liked. Um, what they were saying is that the size of the orbit goes like n squared, and the, radio and the shape of the orbit is um, uh, given by the other formula involving the two quantum numbers. You can also calculate that harmonic ratio, which was just one of the, I just used that for illustration, there were many different quantities uh, that Kepler calculated um, involving pairs of planets as well. But if you, if you calculate that ratio um, of eccentricities, um, there's one sort of slight fly in the ointment. It does depend on two integers, but it's an irrational number. And Kepler had a sort of irrational dislike of, uh, of those numbers. Uh, still, um, it's remarkable how this has um, echoed uh, Kepler's, um, Kepler's vision. But it actually gets even better than that, because that's actually just a kind of ad hoc temporary theory we had of the atom. Our full theory requires me to give you a very short introduction to waves um, uh, in just three slides. So uh, first, here's a picture of a wave, the most visual kind of wave imaginable. You throw a stone into a pond, you get these circular ripples. Now, if you want to describe them mathematically, well, you could start with making a schematic diagram. And the diagram actually looks just like the, the real picture. Uh, those circles are um, what are called wave fronts. They're just the places where the water has risen to the maximum. Um, and then these wave fronts, these circles, that's a snapshot. They're going to move outward. So you can draw lines perpendicular to the wave fronts. Those are the rays. And those lines tell you which way the wave front is moving. You can also do this with the equations, but the pictures are pretty good, too. A wave consists of these wave fronts and rays. Now, there's a subject called ray optics in which you forget about the wave fronts and you just focus on the rays. And uh, you can do a pretty good description of light just by thinking about, uh, or, or of a wave, just by focusing on the rays. And Kepler was actually a, a, one of the pioneers of ray optics. He didn't actually know that lurking behind the rays, there were waves. Uh, but he had this idea that the light travels along these, along these rays. And here's one of the diagrams from his book on optics, where he shows how the rays pass through a lens. And here's a diagram from my 100-level uh, physics course, lecture notes, uh, very similar to what Kepler was doing. And this is, again, an example of how Kepler's minor works are just so incredible, too. Um, you know, he explained the workings of the eye, of the camera obscura, of the telescope. 
and so on using ray optics. But the thing about ray optics that I want to tell you is that it doesn't always work. And ray optics doesn't work, and the full wave nature of, of, of the wave matters. Um, the wave fronts also begin to matter. You need to take them into account. When your wave passes through some small obstruction, um, when the obstruction is small compared to the wavelength of the wave, uh, like, sh like shown in this beautiful picture of ocean waves passing through a small, um, a small gap in a barrier, um, then the waves diffract, they begin to spread out, and you need a full wave picture. Okay, there's one more thing I need to tell you about waves, and then uh, we can move on to, uh, we can return to Kepler's harmonies, uh, which is that waves could be either traveling, like the waves in the pond when you throw a stone, because that's an open medium and they just go on forever. Um, but you could also have waves on, uh, uh, like on, uh, in, in a musical instrument, like a violin string. If it's clamped at both ends, the waves are, uh, can't go, you know, they bounce back and they're trapped uh, just to the violin string. Um, now, if you pluck it carefully, you can produce these pure notes, which look like this, these sort of classic modes, which have their own characteristic frequencies. So when you have confined waves, you have these characteristic frequencies in waves. OK, now here's one of the most inspiring, inspired ideas, inspiring also, but definitely one of the most inspired ideas of uh, modern science. Um, Schrodinger had this idea that matter or electrons were also waves. And all these orbits that we'd spent years talking about uh, for particles, they were just the rays of the waves that we were unaware of. Just like Kepler thought light propagated along those rays and didn't realize that they were wave fronts and that it was a wave, so also with matter. Uh, and that's the wave-particle duality that Jesse referred to. So he wrote down an equation that included the wave fronts as well as the rays. And uh, his point was that within an atom, because atoms are small, it's like, it's like that ocean wave passing through a small barrier, you need the full wave description. Uh, and so in an atom, what you've got is a standing wave, just like the, just like the um, vibrations of a musical instrument. Um, so also, uh, when you have electrons in an atom, they vibrate, and they're just the standing wave modes um, of, uh, of, of the atom. Uh, and so it is really very, very con directly connected to music in, in, in some sense. The states of the hydrogen atom are standing waves of characteristic frequencies. And it turns out that those bohr sommerfeld ellipses um, are, in fact, just the rays that underpin this wave picture. OK, so then I want to move on. And in the, in the couple more minutes that I have, uh, I want to come back now from the atom to the solar system. Um, and just uh, catch you up on what's happened um, since, since this book in the last 400 years. Um, obviously, we have a very different view of the solar system now. Um, you know, the planets are not little points of light anymore, as you can see from this Mars scape over there. Um, now, nothing kills your theory of why there are six planets better than the discovery that there's a seventh planet. Okay. Uh, and this is what happened, not in Kepler's lifetime, um, but in 1781, this was found more or less by chance. Um, actually, it's a mystery why it wasn't found earlier, because you can see it uh, without a telescope. Uh, but the planet Uranus was discovered, um, and so it became the seventh planet. Uh, a much more interesting discovery story, though, is of the eighth planet, which is Neptune. Um, and for this, I need to back up and tell you about uh, Newton, who... Uh, came up with, well, everybody knows the story, so I can move through this pretty quickly. Um, he came up with this idea that you know, there's a force, and he came up with mechanics. And, if you, and then he analyzed the problem of just the sun and one other planet, and he was able to derive Kepler's laws out of his mechanical equations. And so this was an amazing feat. And here you see a portrait of, uh, of, of Newton by Blake um, as a mechanical god of the universe. Actually, I don't think he liked Newton very much, so it's not meant to be flattering, um, but uh, nonetheless. OK. so. Uh, but the problem that Newton did not solve is, what happens if you have something besides just the sun and another planet? What then? What, which is what we really have. We have all these planets. Well, so there were these other giants of uh, mathematics and physics that are named at the bottom of that slide over there. Um, they, um, they, so you start from Kepler's picture. An orbit uh, uh, is characterized by six parameters. A planet is characterized by six parameters. There's the major axis, and the sh which is the size of the orbit, the eccentricity, which is the shape, the anomaly, which tells you where you are on the orbit. But the orbit can also be rotated around in space and reoriented. And so there's three Euler angles, as they're called, which tell you how the orbit is oriented. So there are six parameters that tell you exactly what's going on with the planet. And uh, in Kepler's model, or in Newton's, if you ignore planetary perturbations, then the only thing that changes is the anomaly. The planet goes around the orbit, but the orbit stays fixed in space. 
But what, what these guys, uh, uh, Lagrange and Euler and others, um, not, not Euler, sorry, Lagrange, Gauss, Hamilton and others, what they showed is that under the influence of each other, the planet orbits slowly move, and they wrote down some equations describing how they move. Okay. And using that, they were able to predict. There were some problems with the way um, the orbit of Uranus was moving, even when you took these um, perturbations into account. And what they found is that um, the way to explain that was to hypothesize that there's another planet. And, and, and so the, these guys uh, named over there in 1846 predicted that this planet existed. They predicted where on the sky it should be. And pretty much the same day, I think within 24 hours, it was found, um, the planet Neptune. So that's very impressive indeed. Um, of course, it didn't look like that back then. But, um, but as I said, you know, it's amazing what you can do in 400 years. Um, <laughs> Um, so, so there have been a couple of false alarms as well. There were some anomalies in the orbit of Mercury um, uh, around that time. But it turned out this time that our theory of gravity was wrong. And in fact, um, Einstein's theory of gravity explains those anomalies in the orbit of Mercury. And then there were some anomalies in the, or, uh, in the orbit of Uranus and Neptune that emerged as well as they were observed more and more closely. And those led, led to the discovery of Pluto, but that was an accident because Pluto is far too small to be perturbing Uranus and Neptune. Um, and it's not really a planet after all. Uh, but what really happened over here was that these um, anomalies disappeared as better data came along in the 1990s, um, we found um, there was never an anomaly. So the question remains, is there a ninth planet? And here, what we're looking at is what's called the Kuiper Belt, uh, which is all these icy chunks, including Pluto, that exist beyond the orbit of Neptune. This is, of course, just an artist's conception, uh, but it's a very nice, uh, uh, nice image. So. So I couldn't resist putting it up. Um, so, so this is what, the, what it looks like. You've got these icy chunks over there. Thousands of them have been observed. Maybe there's millions of them out there. Uh, but lurking within them, is there a large planet as well? Well, um, within the last um, few years, uh, there's some growing evidence that there might be a ninth planet as well. Um, so this seems like an interesting thing, something that would interest Kepler. He was always interested in knowing how many planets there are. Uh, what you see in this data over here is the orbits of um, about a dozen of these outer Kuiper belt objects. You should focus on the ones that are in purple. And what's remarkable is that all these orbits kind of line up with each other, kind of like those arrows that Jesse was showing lining up in the morning. They don't line up so well, but uh, you know, compare that to being totally random. Uh, they are somewhat aligned, and that's the evidence we have. Um, I meant to talk about our work in this area as well, but I realize I'm out of time, and I realized that yesterday also, so I've left that out. But there may be a, uh, you know, there might be Planet Nine, but uh, with my collaborator Kate Brown, we have some work in progress that um, I was just telling Stacy about recently, uh, which may connect to what he was saying about the anomalies in galaxy rotation as well. So we're very excited about that work, but um, I'm going to move on and uh, close out with uh, telling you about why the Kepler Space Telescope is named after Kepler. And it's not merely because he's a great, uh, great scientist, although, of course, that's a good enough reason. But it's also because of some work that Kepler did, uh, which is perhaps one of his more minor works, but is still uh, really remarkable. So uh, I need to tell you a little bit about this book, The Rudolphine Tables, which we heard about from Aviva this morning um, also. Um, this is not one of his minor works. In fact, he calls it my chief astronomical work. And it was backbreaking labor to produce this book. He worked on it on and off for about 20 years. Um, what it includes is tables of Brahe's data. It includes, um, but it also includes, and this is what's heartbreaking to see, uh, tables of logarithms that he painstakingly computed himself, tables of solutions to that anomaly equation, like pages and pages of that stuff, which he could do in, like, with a keystroke. Um, uh, on your phone. And, um, and then there are instructions and examples in Latin um, on how to use these tables. But what these tables do is they implement the system that Kepler had developed um, for predicting planetary positions. And to show off what you could do with it, um, what Kepler did was he calculated transits of Mercury. Um, he, he figured that Mercury might sometimes pass in front of the sun, and so he calculated when that might next happen. And somebody else, using the same tables also predicted the next transit of Venus. And these things were observed, and they happened exactly as Kepler's tables foretold. So this was historically very important. Um, 
I guess we don't care that much about transits, but it's still kind of fun, fun when they happen. Some of you might remember there was a transit of Venus in 2012. There's actually a pair of them. They come in pairs. So there's one in 2004, one, one in 2012, and the next one's going to be 100 years later. So it's always 100 years, 8 years, 100 years, 8 years. That's how they're spaced. So if you didn't see it, um, I guess you missed your chance. Um, yeah, but th there's some of us in Strasacker uh, viewing it, and here's what it looked like if you, if you had a space probe uh, to observe it. Okay, so the, tr uh, so the thing about the transits is, um, if there are planets around other stars, and of course there are, and we now know that, um, so once in a while they would pass in front, of, in fact, rather frequently, they would pass in front of that star, and so the light of that star should dim. Well, that should happen if the orbit, if we happen to be in the plane of the orbit, and that's not very likely. So if you look at a typical star, even if it has planets, they are unlikely to actually pass in front of it. But um, if you look at enough stars, uh, and that's why I call this mission improbable. Uh, if there are enough stars, you will, uh, you will see these transits. And that's what the Kepler mission does. It looks for these little dips, and it infers the existence of planets. And now we know of, of thousands of planets, um, such as this one over here, which is like uh, Luke Skywalker's homeworld um, in orbit around two stars. And so, so, so this is really um, uh, quite, quite incredible. Uh, I think one of the most exciting things that's happened um, in our lifetimes. Um, I guess I'm going to end by letting, uh, by letting Kepler have the last word, um, which is, uh, as you sort of wonder what he would have made of all of this, of what we understand about the universe today. And of course, we don't know what he would have thought about it. But it's clear he was very open-minded, because um, this is what he says about the evolution of his own ideas from, from this book to the harmonies of the world, that uh, things happen not in the mode wherein I had conceived it in my mind, and this is not last in my joy, but in a very different mode that is also very excellent and very perfect. And so I hope he would also consider what we've now discovered very excellent and very perfect. And I guess I'm gonna stop here. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, yes, so, uh, so this is actually um, going, going over to particle physics. And just to repeat the question for people who uh, might be streaming, um, uh, Chris just asked me um, to elaborate on the technical meaning of naturalness. Um, and so the point is that if you look at the parameters that go into the standard model of particle physics, the three of them, there's Planck's constant, um, there's the speed of light, and then there's Newton's constant g. And if you combine them, um, you can figure out that the natural mass scale is um, something called the Planck mass, which is much bigger than the masses of elementary particles. And that's puzzling, because it turns out that this kind of analysis normally that you do, where you think about all the parameters and you try to make up uh, something which has the right units, it's called dimensional analysis, it usually works extremely well. And very often, you know, you can predict what the answer of, to a question is going to be using just dimensional analysis, and then you spend all your time doing detailed calculations just to, well, you know, get more precise answers. But you can get the right ballpark estimate at least. And so here's a case where the ballpark estimate is, you know, dozens of orders of magnitude off. So, um, so na but naturalness is the idea that um, um, uh, that things should follow this kind of analysis, and when they don't, um, you have to try to explain that. Uh, it's a little bit more technical than that because uh, then you have to within the context, context of quantum field theory, um, if things don't quite line up, that's OK. What you have to worry about is whether quantum effects, you know, do they tend to drive things towards lining up in this way with dimensional analysis, or, or do they not? And so if your answer is way off, way off dimensional analysis, but it's somehow stable to quantum fluctuations, um, then again, you can declare that that's natural. But um, so, so let, me, let me give you a concrete example again with the masses of the elementary particles. They're very light compared to the Planck mass. Uh, there's nothing that can be done about that. Um, actually, particle physicists are very creative. There's something that can be done about that too. <laughs> uh, but let's work with models where nothing can be done about that. Uh, so what you can do is you can create models, and these are models called supersymmetry, where you introduce a partner to every particle, in which although these masses are very different from what they should be, that's OK. Um, you know, if they are over there, they'll stay there, and, and you don't need to worry about it. 
So, so that's, that's the kind of naturalness arguments that particle physicists use. And that's why they believe in su supersymmetry, and that's why machines like the Super Collider, which we saw pictures of, it's the biggest machine humanity has ever built. They're built on this faith that you know, naturalness is guiding, guiding us to these supersymmetric partners, and we must look for them. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. So, so I think the answer to the, that question is no, we'll never be satisfied. <laughs> uh, the short answer to that question. But um, because you always want to understand more, and I don't think you can arrive at you know, a final theory. Um, even though people have talked about final theories, um, and physicists have, but I don't think that's really possible. Um, but yes, uh, I don't want to get into trouble here, so I want to be careful to say I'm not necessarily saying explaining the pattern of masses is like explaining the, why there are six planets. But it could turn out to be like that. We really don't know what type of question it is. Um, we may find an explanation for why there's that pattern, and that would be really exciting. But it might also turn out it's just that way, and there's no explanation, for, no, no better explanation. Um, some people think that's like an admitting defeat, and I think Steven Weinberg does think that. If you say that these masses are just whatever they are, um, you're giving up. You're not doing science anymore. But I don't think that's really right. I think uh, what will happen is that either we'll explain the pattern of masses, or we'll realize it's not really a meaningful question. But it won't just be. It'll, it, it won't stop being meaningful because we've given up. But it's because of the new theory that emerges. Within that, we'll see that it's not a useful question. Um, in the same way that you know, Kepler's question became, um, you know, we realized it wasn't a meaningful thing to ask because there was nothing special about those sizes. And that's just an evolutionary detail of the solar system. Mm -hmm. I mean, is that really how people think? That's sort of the dream, but, you know, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cool. But there's, I guess there's levels of contingency, right? Like the, I mean, we, I think we do demand of people who model the origins of the solar system that they should make it seem natural that it's more or less flat. And, you know, the fact that all the orbital elements are such that they all lie in the same plane. Um, we don't want to explain exactly what the inclination angles of different planets are like Kepler would have wanted to do, but we want to explain that they're all more or less in the same inclination and they're all more or less in the same plane. Yeah. But with the standard model, with the particles, we really want ideally to have, you know, to 10 places, 10 decimal places where the masses are. If we could do that, I think we'd be very happy. Uh, okay, go ahead, go ahead. Uh. Yeah, I, I think um, that that is the problem, right? We don't know. Uh, uh, I, I think you've sort of uh, put in focus uh, the, the same point I was trying to make, that um, that we don't really know what questions are good questions and are answerable. Uh, we only know that in hindsight. And, uh, you know, you never have hindsight. <laughs> Others do. Yeah. So I, I wonder if, in light of the time, we should uh, wrap up here and people can grab coffee before the panel. All right, well, thanks, everyone, for your attention.
So the point of this final panel is for us all to have a chance to talk with each other and for everybody to talk with all of us as a group. Um, and I guess, um, why don't I start first by asking any of the panelists who have questions for each other to, to volunteer a question, and then we can turn to the audience and to the live stream if anybody has questions. Anybody want to? I have a question for you, actually. <laughs> okay. Um, so I, I've always viewed Kepler as a weird person. I've tried to make that clear. Um, I'm just wondering, like, how weird is he relative to your average mathematician slash natural philosopher uh, at, at that time, present mm. company excluded, <laughs> I don't know if I'm the best person to answer that just because I like Kepler a lot. Um. Is everybody doing the kind of little of this, little of that, little what have you? Uh, the fact that he's a, a polymath is less unusual for his time than it would be for ours, certainly, right? I mean, the, um, uh, the, the disciplines are not as divided, um, you know, uh, they're not, certainly not divided in the ways that ours are, but, um, but his scope of interests, I can think of lots of people um, of his time who were, you know, similarly broad-minded in their approach. I think um, his weirdness, in some sense, his, his weirdness, maybe this is, you know, to go back to where I started, is that he is such a nice guy. I mean, you, don't, you think about some of these other, you know, famous figures in the history of science, um, Galileo, Newton, they're really not. Um, you know, uh, they, um, they, they have egos that go along with their, um, with their talents. Um, and, and Kepler's always the guy who doesn't really care if he gets credit for his ideas as long as people are talking about them as long as they're spreading. And it's also, um, I think this came up in um, one of the questions, I'm remembering the question that, that Bruce got about um, music and you know uh, Catholic versus Protestant music. He's the guy who talks across boundaries, um, not just when it comes to music, but when it comes to um, even questions of chronology, right? The questions of you know dating the birth of Christ, right? Which you'd think would be a loaded confessional question. He'll listen to Jesuits and talk about their theories with them and use them if he thinks they're better. Um, so he doesn't like um, boundaries, um, both disciplinary ones and political ones and theological ones, which, which I guess in that, you know, um, especially in the theological and political sense, I think maybe does make him somewhat unusual. Can I just toss something out about weirdness in his ideas about music? Mm -hmm. um, and also, just to say, I, I think so, sometimes we lose track of the fact that harmony and music is not synonymous. Mm -hmm. and we look at his uh, calculations of the ratios of the planet's orbits, angular velocities, and them being um, the same as the, or nearly, as, as the ratios of the note, the intervals of the musical scale. <clears throat> um, and that's, that's fine. I think when he goes into talking about Mercury being the soprano and uh, Earth being the tenor and Jupiter being the Base, that's a bit weird and a bit um, off the mark. In fact, it doesn't correspond to the way musical compositions are constructed. But it doesn't matter because you know I, I think Kepler himself understood um, this: the fact that harmony is not music. Um, and when he approaches music, he really approaches it much more from the standpoint of the practicing musician. That's why he puts so much emphasis on Orlando di Lasso. And he, he is most, I think, the most convincing when he talks about music from the standpoint of, of rhetoric. And he, he really felt passionate that music is not just harmony. Music is communication of passion and emotion. So I think we sometimes we lose track of that side of Kepler, because we see this nice, um, these pictures of the musical scales with the names of the planets, and it's all very cute. Uh, <laughs> maybe I think a little bit weird, but um, there was this other side where he was seriously, as as Bernie said, seriously sensible, sensitive to the power of music as a communications um, means of communication. Mm -hmm. 
And there too, he's, he's following in a platonic tradition, right? Um, I think Plato also saw music both, you know, both in a cosmic sense um, and in a, a rhetorical sense and, and even in a political sense, right? He talks about music in the Republic and the political effect it can have on, on citizenry. So, so there's a tradition of that too. But you, you bring one other point to mind and then I'll stop talking, which is that you know, for Kepler, harmony, um, is a rational thing, right? It's rational, not audible, um, which means that it requires not just two things that are similar to each other in, an, you know, in a significant ratio, but also somebody to appreciate that significance. It requires a, third, a mind, right? Which for him is also why it's important that the earth is placed where it is, right? We're placed at just the, the, just the position between everything where we can appreciate you know, the um, rational harmonies happening around us. And we haven't exactly mentioned this, but um, Kepler's cosmos, although it's uh, heliocentric is um, also anthropocentric, right? Um, our, our place matters and it's important. So, so one thing that strikes me as weird, and this is an unfair modern perspective, but it's the whole business of inscribed polyhedron and setting things. I mean, that just, just you know, from a modern perspective, that just sounds crazy. Um, and that's not fair, as I say. At the time, maybe it made some kind of sense, but as somebody who's maybe a little weird and has played with strange things in his youth, and besides, <laughs> if I were gonna do something like that, I would want there to be an order to the progression of the polyhedria, that you start with the tetrahedron and go to more and more vertices, and yet that's not what's in his model. It is. is it is. It is. He has a, a logic for the order. Okay, so that, that's my question, is what, what is the logic and how does that uh, work? Let me see if I can remember enough to recount it. There are primary platonic solids and secondary platonic solids. And um, the primaries are, I think, all the, the primaries are the ones made up of figures other than triangles. <laughs> so, right, the pentagon and the square, um, whereas the secondaries are all, you know, make, made up of triangles in different formations. And the um, primaries stand on a face, whereas the secondaries stand on a, uh, a vertex, I think. He has other, um, and they're related to the, their relationship to the sphere, which is for him the most perfect of, of figures. So he has the earth in the middle, and then um, they move away from the earth based on prim with primaries going in one direction and secondaries going in another direction. Okay, um, so that's where the anthropocentric thing comes yes, into it. Yes. Okay. So he does have a logic for this, yeah. although, you know, it's an after the, it's, once he thinks the platonic solids are correct, right, it's, wiggle, you know, playing with the data to get it to fit, right? And there's, in, in playing with the data like that, I'm sure there's some urge, okay, it didn't get work to go from here to there. Let's start from here. Oh, that makes sense if I, yeah, so. I'm sure it was an Yeah, so the process. aesthetic and the geometric and then the data are all kind of working together there to get a model that fits. It, it does remind me of particle physicists and their grand unified theories where they're playing with different Lie groups and trying to see which one is better suited. Yeah. Um, so, so, yeah. I mean, I think the thing that, that, you know, we were talking about curve fitting and whether it's good evidence for something being true or not. The thing we sort of didn't mention is that, you know, the number of parameters you have to vary, uh, you know, if, if, if you're varying more parameters than there are data points, then, then <laughs> most people would agree that it's meaningless. And it sounds like there's only five platonic solids. You could come up with a reason why they're ordered the way they are for any order. Um, and similarly with modern theories of particle physics, uh, if you have enough degrees of freedom, you know, in the possible string theories you can, uh, you can concoct, uh, if one of them works, does that really, uh, you know, mean anything? Well, there they had the problem that they thought it was going to be unique, and now it turns out to be incredibly non-unique. <laughs> um, yeah. Hello, uh, my name's David Farrell. I'm an emeritus of the physics department. Uh, firstly, just congratulations and thanks to everybody involved in this. I only wish I had had such an event before I started teaching physics, uh, particularly <laughs> at the elementary level concerned with Newton's equations, because in an attempt to make those lectures a little bit better, I went into Harmonica Mundi 
and concluded that its author was just crazy. <laughs> it bore no relation to anything I knew about harmony and so on and so forth. And what you have managed to achieve, I think particularly from the physics component, is that he was struggling with everything in his power to find symmetry and simple correspondences in exactly the same way as people are studying physics now. And that is just a wonderful re revelation. It's come a little bit late, <laughs> but thank you for it. Actually, I just wanted to briefly respond to Dave's comment and say, uh, yeah, it's, it's actually been really instructive in terms of you know, teaching physics. And I feel like I've come, up, come away with a couple of problems for my mechanics course from reading Really? <laughs> well, like the one I mentioned, actually, even in passing, that you know, show that the ratio of those frequencies is related to the eccentricities. Yeah. Um, that's going to be a relatively easy one, but there's a few other problems. Uh, uh, that, yeah. <clears throat> so I want to take a little bit of a step back from the details of Kepler and more about what we're doing today. You know, what brought us together was the book, right, and thinking about the history. When I bring the astronomy students over to the library to look at these books, a lot of times they start off thinking, it's, it's history, what does it have to do with astronomy? Why, why do I need to learn it for science? And then they look at the books and they get excited, right? They really understand the history of, of what brought them there. And you all, from a historical and from a librarian perspective, you learn about the history of science by studying these writings. And what I'm wondering about is, you know, 400 years from now, when people look back at what we are doing as scientists, we don't write like that, <laughs> right? We don't have physical, I mean, we publish electronic journals. And what is it that you think is gonna be the, the tangible scientific things that people are looking at to build their ideas of how did scientists of today develop ideas and struggle with the science, as opposed to just looking at the journal articles. Anybody want to start off? <laughs> uh, I, I'm not, I can start just by saying that I was thinking, especially um, during Stacy's talk, that um, one of the, the virtues of, of a writer like Kepler is that he's in his publications, up, he's not just verbose, he's upfront about his failures, right? <laughs> he, um, he, he will tell you the different steps he went through, he'll say, I tried this and then it failed, and he does, you know, in the new astronomy, it's a battle with Mars he's engaged in, and he's gonna take us every step of the way. So I guess, you know, um, I, I, want, I would love to hear from the scientists about how, how upfront people still are about those failures, even if in a sort of you know, succinct form. But I will say too that historians look at um, not just published work, even you know, when we're going back 400 years, we have you know, treasure troves of letters and things like that where people are writing to their you know, um, mentors, friends, colleagues as they're working out their theories. And presumably such, you know, such documents will be available to historians of the future, although you know, um, electronic uh, transactions are a little more ephemeral. <laughs> Right. So I guess this is, you know, open this for others. Well, the archivist says, yes, please do save your emails. Um, and, uh, you know, but it is a very different ball of wax. Um, but it's, it's one that we feel like we're on top of. Whether they will have the same effect on scholars and students for 400 years from now, it's hard to say. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a recognized thing. Yeah, just follow up real quick. When you say you have a handbook, what, 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 is the, what is the record of today that's being kept for Sure. And it's the um, e electronic archival uh, function that we serve. Um, and that is as simple as, I, you know, I've said it half jokingly, but save your emails, um, you know, and, and that's, that, that, that's a real thing. And, and that's something that our university archivists work, work with as well. And Alan's gonna help us out too. Well, I deal in 19th century science, and they have rich, rich uh, archives of letters. Uh, now, anyway, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of letters. And I'm in the archives in, in Europe, you know, going through these letters. The uh, correspondence is much thinner that you can rely on uh, I mean, but for the for the 16th, 17th century, uh, this is a real problem, and I think for, for future historians of science, and I think the because all of this 
and, and people uh, go to the conferences and they have conversations, they talk by phone, email, it's all lost mm -hmm. uh, to the record. So I think what's going to be particularly important for the future of history of science is uh, oral history and biography <laughs> and autobiography. So I, I would comment in this context because it occurred to me when you were talking about him actually just sending out the first printing, right, to people he thought was important to get it. It's what we used to do with preprints, right? We'd write a paper and, you know, we would know scientists that we thought this would be of interest to and we would just mail them a copy. And uh, similarly, our institute had a preprint rack where We'd also mail them to important institutions and they'd put it on the rack and then anybody walking by could pick it up and say, oh, this is interesting. And so, so the method in which we communicate science with each other has also changed because, you know, what I just described is exactly what it, it that's what made me remember it, is that what Kepler was sending preprints to people. And uh, now we post these things on the archive, which is a great electronic resource. And on the one hand, the audience is much broader, but it's also more reliant on the audience to take an active uh, participation and, and look at that. And when I was younger, I faithfully read every abstract in my field on the archive. I surely do not do that today. Um, and I'm grateful when people do email me and say, oh, hey, I posted this paper, because otherwise it's not going to rise to my attention. There's just too many things to keep track of. But I guess what I'm saying is I've noticed a real phase transition, if that's the right term, for how we actually communicate these things. Um, you know, I used to learn things in a library. I would go and pick up a bound copy of the journal, and I would be looking for something. And I'd know the page number and reference, but I'd open it somewhere else. And, oh, this is interesting. And I would <laughs> learn by serendipity things that I did not go looking for. Um, right now, um, you know, that doesn't happen, I don't think, mm -hmm. with electronic journals. You know exactly where you're going. You have no idea what the neighboring paper is about. I think we also should think about Kepler when he talks about how much he loved the music of Orlando di Lasso and cites specific motets. Um, he didn't find scores of that on IMSLP or listen to the pieces on YouTube. I mean, he had to, uh, the music was transmitted in part books. And so he had to have probably, unless someone else did this work for him, he had to score these pieces from individual part books and have enough uh, ability to imagine music from a score in order to have this appreciation for that music. Of course, he would have heard some of it performed in Graz and in Prague, but um, we tend to think it's so easy to have access to music and, and also listen to it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Do you want to add guess, to that? Yeah. I, I guess I just had uh, responding to Chris's question. I'm not really, I'm responding to the question with a question. And I guess for the historians here, which is that I think that the nature of science has changed as well. And so science history would have to change with that, right? Um, because in Kepler's day, there was only a handful of people really who were practicing scientists. And so it makes sense to focus on individuals and their correspondence and so on. But now science, you know, if you look at the scientific communities, they're like entire nations. They could fill an entire nation with scientists. Um, and, and so it's become a little bit like the more, more general problem that, you know, people who do history outside of history of science have, which is that uh, they've traditionally focused on the chronicles of kings, but there's also a growing realization that it's really, you know, you should really focus on the, uh, uh, on the larger uh, mass of people. Uh, that, that would be the real history, and how do you tell that story? Um, is the challenge that I think historians of uh, that historians in general are facing, and I think historians of science might have to address in the future. In that sense, you know, uh, it will be easier to do history of science in the future than it was in the past because that was true then too, right? The history of science is never just the history of great men, but those are the people who in the past left records, right? So the historians who are working on earlier science and trying to excavate the more general history have a really tough time. Um, whereas in a certain sense, right, our challenge, the, the community of scientists is bigger, but our access to more members of that community is easier to obtain. Alan, did you want to add to that? Uh, I don't want to stop 
this part of the conversation, but I have another question that goes in a different direction. Did anybody else want to add to this? I'll share one thing, which is sort of part of the original question was about what will inspire people in the future. Um, if, and like in keeping with what Harsh is saying, that science becomes more of a large scale collective enterprise, I think these huge, these huge experiments that we perform now will be inspirational to, to people in the future, kind of like, like the cathedrals mm -hmm. uh, historically, Bill, are so amazing that people at that time put that much effort and collective money and time into building these things. To see like, you know, the people of the future will say, of course, now today we can all create Higg bosons on our cell phones. But back then they had to build this huge device and uh, spent billions of dollars, which at the time was a lot of money. Um, and and uh, I think people will find that inspirational. Um, so I, I want to ask a question about um, a factor that Aviva took, uh, drew attention to. Uh, it has to do with Kepler and it has to do with theory choice and maybe uh, a larger question about how science is done also today. Um, and that is the change between the Ptolemaic uh, style of science and what Kepler did. Uh, Aviva drew attention to this, that, that Kepler uh, had uh, accomplished a, a revolution, in a sense, by looking at physical causation. Uh, and this is something that uh, was new, as Aviva pointed out, and was not characteristic of the Ptolemaic tradition. Ptolemaic tradition was purely calculational. It was abstract mathematics to, to track uh, the motions observed in the sky. And when uh, Kepler uh, made this new focus on physical uh, causation, really, of, of what's happening in the, in the, in the three-dimensional real world. Uh, he, put, he put us on a moving Earth, and that made a difference because if, you're, uh, if you believe in Ptolemy and a, cent a central Earth, then this is just a shadow play in the sky. You cannot, uh, you're fixed in one position, you cannot uh, move to, to uh, do trigonometry, triangulation, and look at relative distances. So, so the Ptolemaic tradition could not create a model of the solar system with relative uh, 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 sizes of the orbits the way uh, Kepler could. Uh, moving Earth, you can triangulate, you can, and this, this has to do with um, what Stacy was talking about, the eight minutes of an arc, it also has to do with, uh, with Chris's talk about theory choice, you know, and this is something that, that Kepler was able to offer, uh, which was uh, uh, ca categorically different from what the uh, Ptolemaic theory could, could provide. So that's sort of a comment, but it also, uh, off I, I want to hear your reactions to it, but also maybe it's applicable to modern physics. You know, the purely mathematical approach versus, uh, calcul that is a calculational, abstract calculational approach versus, you know, what's happening in the real world. Anybody want to start? Chris, did you want to start based on the question? No. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, the, the, the idea of the planets as physical entities that were moving around and the Earth was one of those, um, that is a different conceptual thing that's, that is, as you say, categorically different from the Ptolemaic conception. Uh, and so uh, that's certainly important to me now. Um, what, in the sense that, you know, if I go to a, a particular galaxy uh, and I want to predict what the motions in that are, I, I want to do it for that galaxy. I don't want to speak in generalized terms of, oh, there's some dark matter there, and so that's going to enhance the speeds. That doesn't let me say that this galaxy will have this speed, um, and I can do that with modified gravity. And I can do that successfully. So that's a categorical difference that exists today in the same manner. Well, you know, whatever the background cause for that is, um, it's something that you can do and show you can do. 
And you simply cannot do in the standard picture. You, you cannot take dark matter and predict those motions in advance. You can always explain them um, after the fact. Uh, but, but that's a category difference that's, that's very much alive today. And, and a lot of the people I know who work on the theories of dark matter just doesn't seem to worry them. It doesn't impinge on their mathematical abstraction of what's going on, which seems to have more to do with how do you build a particle physics theory that could be the stuff. And then that's sufficient, I guess, to them. Um, whereas it doesn't even address the questions I'm concerned with. Another related example is, uh, I was talking with Chris during the break about interpretations of quantum mechanics, um, in that there's, there's, there's a number of, well, there are different mathematical formulations for quantum mechanics that are equivalent, uh, you know, formally, but different ones are useful in different situations. And then which one is, is one true? Um, well, we don't even know, we, we don't even know what quantum mechanics means, you know, that, that the equations work, uh, Different equations work better in different situations, but what it means, which is a question I'm not equipped to answer, uh, how to interpret it. Um, and there's endless arguments, of course, um, based on, you know, uh, which is the most seemingly natural, maybe not in the sense you were saying, but um, which is the most simple um, and endless argument. So along that line, maybe an analogy, you'll tell me this is getting more close or not. An analogy to what I was saying is uh, the Copenhagen interpretation is sort of abstract and hardly hard, hard to understand how it, it's real. David Bohm is more um, more in the line of, of this Kepler physicality idea. Where is David Bohm's ideas? Where do they stand now? Um, so my, my understanding is that um, the way it was originally conceived has been di disproven. Um, there is some um, experimental tests that you can do, uh, which, are, which is B Bell's inequality, the Bell's theorem, that shows that uh, quantum mechanics has to either be non-local or indeterminate. Uh, so something strange is going on, in other words. Uh, now, I, I think that they have versions of Bohmian mechanics that are non-local, uh, meaning things are able to instantaneously influence each other over long distances. Um, so that's still, I think, a workable interpretation, but it is certainly not getting around the fact that something very strange is going on. You can correct me if I'm wrong about that. Uh, no, that, that's, I mean, at least that's my understanding as well. But I guess I, I will amplify on that and say that, uh, you know, there are levels and levels of being t Ptolemaic. Um, so, like you said, uh, Copenhagen's pretty abstract. But uh, there's a famous quote from Dirac where, you know, even that was too concrete for him. Uh, you know, what he says is, I'm not really interested in interpretation of quantum mechanics. I'm interested in more fundamental questions. <laughs> that, that's, that's Dirac's view. And that's a very Ptolemaic view. I think it's really about you know, the mathematics and calculation and prediction, and never mind uh, the concreteness or the, you know, what it means, even. Um, but I also have to say that's got an important place in science. I think uh, you know, uh, certainly Dirac, but also Ptolemy were, are, are you know, important figures in science. And I think, as Stacy said, it, it's a system that worked for a thousand years. Um, so, so there's something to be said for it. <laughs> well, I mean, it's true also that like many many of our theories we know are wrong. Mm -hmm. I mean, they they have to be wrong because, like, um, like gravity, for example, uh, you know, doesn't fit into that picture of the standard model. And so there's some there's got to be something missing somewhere. But we use it anyway, you know, <laughs> and, and uh, don't worry about it too much. But when you when you say you don't worry about it, I mean, so I mean, th to me, this is the thing that more than anything um, fascinates me about the scientific revolution. Like I can imagine myself not really caring about empirical evidence. I can imagine myself not caring about experiments or like the use of mathematics. But when I try to imagine not 
even, it not even crossing my mind that I would draw a physical inference from a successful mathematical model. I don't find that comprehensible at all. Um, and so when you say not worry about it, what it means, do you mean uh, we assume that it has some physical meaning, but we don't need to know what that meaning is in order to work with it, or we don't care whether it has a, a physical meaning or not. That's not a scientific question. Um, okay, I was nodding to the first one, but then I found I was nodding to the second one as well. <laughs> <laughs> so I think the question should probably be put to Dirac about what he had in mind oh. uh, when he did not care. Um, but I think these are both attitudes one can adopt. Okay. Yeah. You know, we do this all the time in astronomy, right? I mean, there are, there are relationships that, like, like Stacy talks about the Tully Fisher, right? there, there are empirical correlations between the properties of objects that we use all the time to get distances or to understand how, you know, the, 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 the scale of the universe. And we can use those correlations for certain things and not worry about why they exist. But the bigger picture is that they do exist and we gotta figure out why. So, <laughs> so the Tully Fisher relationship that Stacy talks about, we can use that to get distances pretty well in the universe, even though we don't understand what, what it means. Uh -huh. But then we also have the work to do of what it means. So, so astronomers at least are very good at separating those two things. <laughs> I don't understand if I could use it and then over here, okay, now let me think about what it means. Yeah, okay. Well, I mean, I think that, like, in the case of quantum mechanics, everyone would like to know <laughs> the answer. Like, Dirac, if someone could prove the answer to Dirac, he probably would have been willing to listen. But maybe you look at that question and say, this is too hard for me. Uh, you know, I don't think we're going to be able to solve it, so let's, let's set it aside and, and get interested in other things. Okay. So yeah, I think there's a hierarchy there. Yes on one, you, you, you want that, but if you can't really wrap your head around it, you'll still use it. Um, and things like the interpretation of quantum mechanics is a good example of maybe it's just beyond our <laughs> intellectual ability as human beings, um, or at least most of us certainly. And so at some point you work with it, um, you take from it what you can use, and you kind of give up on this. In astronomy, it's, it's the distance scale, right? We can quantify how far away it is to the next star, to the next galaxy, whatever. These numbers we use all the time, and we get to the point where we can recognize, well, that's a sensible answer or that's not, and yet our minds cannot possibly conceive of these distance scales. There's just no way we can really appreciate the vastness of the universe we can put a number on it, <laughs> but we have no visceral feel for what that means. Like me with Celsius. <laughs> Do, so for, this is for historians and physicists and musicians um, and librarians. Uh, do you think that we're, we're just going through, rather than developing understanding as being kind of a feature that's endemic to the scientific process, do you think that it might just be a phase that we're going through and have kind of, are starting to near the end of um, as things become more and more accurate, mathematically sophisticated and less physically comprehensible? I mean, so like with, you know, the, the rise of big data where we can develop empirically adequate, even predictive models that don't appear to have any physical significance. Um, is that a possible or plausible future for, for science? I sure hope not. Um, I mean, the whole point to me is to develop an understanding, a, a, a really a visceral intuition for how things work and why they are the way they are. Um, and it, it is sort of where it overlaps with both philosophy and religion there. You want to know uh -huh. uh, not just the how, but the why. And if we lapse into just saying, okay, well, we can massage the numbers and, and do that very effectively to achieve some goal, 
oh, big deal. That doesn't really tell you what's going on. And, and in fact, this is one of my objections to the giant simulations that people do in my field is that, you know, they throw everything in, including the kitchen sink, burn, you know, tons of carbon calculating things very well. And you ask, and they say, okay, this reproduces the universe. Okay, well, how? I don't know. You know, I put it in there, but they, you know, it's so complicated, it doesn't provide you any intuition for what's going on. Uh, that's, that's useless, as far as I'm concerned, from a scientific point of view. Anybody else want to comment on that? It's hard to predict the future. Yeah. Would you be okay with such a future? Stacey I can imagine. Doesn't want I can imagine to see that. Day. I can imagine worse. <laughs> <laughs> That's a little like Han Solo. I can imagine a lot. <laughs> Any other questions? So one more, and, and this goes back to I, you know, Chris, you had asked um, about do we get to a point where we're just happy enough with it? And I actually would turn it upside down and say, at what point do we decide we are unhappy enough with the theory that tweaking it isn't going to work and we just throw it out? I mean, I one time asked a, a dark matter experimentalist, you know, we've been looking for years for dark matter and we haven't found it. At what point do we stop trying? And so, so you know, and how do we know when we've gotten to the point in the theory where it's just so broken that it's time to move on? And, and I don't know the answer to that, but I think a lot of people need to be struggling with that. Yeah. I don't know what you all <laughs> well, What did the experimentalist say? Yeah. <laughs> he wanted another grant. <laughs> 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 right? Why would you even ask that? <laughs> well, I think it's true that it's like, it's like all connected to kind of like personal sociological kind of things that, you know, Science is this grand enterprise, but it's also someone's job, you know. And you want to keep keep your job, and and uh, maybe get some fame out of it. Um, and so those things all really impact, like what kind of theories people use and what they study. And um, when I I published, it's actually my paper on on music theory and statistical mechanics. I published it in the journal Science Advances, and when I typed that into Google. It auto-filled it for me. Science advances one funeral at a time. <laughs> <laughs> the Google knows. <laughs> well, so, so that, uh, that's actually an interesting point because, of course, that's Planck's old quip about difficult colleagues. But, but you highlighted the importance of the big collaborations and the big machines that we're making. And so... I mean, that's not really true anymore because it's not a few great men. Um, it's, it's these edifices of, of um, social groups in some sense, and those are sort of self-sustaining because uh, when one leader does pass on, well, then somebody else will take over leadership, and there's a whole community of people who are invested in that. Uh, so, I mean, I think that comes up at least in the context of dark matter, maybe also in the context of building ever bigger particle colliders is, you know, if you have the momentum of a community that does that, then there's an urge to keep doing that, whether or not there's a good, really scientific argument for that, right? Sabine Hassenfelder had this uh, article in the New York Times that made her very unpopular, saying, really, there's no reason to build another generation of particle accelerators. And of course, all the people who did that was like, oh, of course we have to do that, because that's what we do, not because they had a good scientific argument for it. Um, and so I guess that's a, a transition in, in how these things work that is both good and bad. Um, yeah. I think the way new things can happen, though, is, is when suddenly there's some new, very attractive thing that all those people can apply their skills to. Like, um, I, I think that was one of the things that made graphene so popular in the condensed mm -hmm. matter physics mm -hmm. community when it was discovered in like 2005, was that it was this very new kind of material, single layer of atoms thick that behave very differently than normal materials. And suddenly everyone that studied normal materials realized I could do the same experiments that I've been doing my whole career on this new material and it will give me something different. And so suddenly everyone was doing that. Um, and so that was a very sudden shift um, because it 
worked to the advantage of everyone's, uh, you know, everyone's individual, you know, scientific career. Which is this may be our last because I think we oh, are out of time. <laughs> that's a lot of pressure. I'm not sure if it's a good <laughs> enough question. <laughs> the last question. Um, well, it was about the book actually, and you mentioned that it's almost completely unmarked except for these two doctors. Um, and I realize you haven't done a complete census of all, 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 all volumes of it, but uh, you compared it to a first edition, I think. So I was wondering if you could tell us something about what's known about some of the other copies, at least. Of the, of the Mysterium Cosmographicum? Yeah, either edition. Sure. Um, mostly that um, the first edition is much more rare because so few copies were printed. Um, and that the second edition becomes more valuable because even a, a copy like ours that does not have any uh, tertiary marginalia in it, it has, in effect, Kepler's own marginalia um, because he, um, he annotates each chapter pointing out, you know, this is what I meant by this or I worked on this more and here's how I changed my mind. Um, so that's kind of a... Um, I know when we found this, this second edition um, available that Aviva said, oh, that's actually some, in some ways better than having a first edition <laughs> because we have, we have um, Kepler's thoughts uh, looking back in, in retrospect. Um, so I, I haven't personally seen any other copies, so I can't really speak to that. Um, there are a number of digitized copies that I've looked at. Many of them are very well, mar you know, heavily marked up. Um, so it was a book that, uh, that had impact um, it, it, from the first edition. Uh, it really, it really made a distinct impact. All right. I guess it's nice that we started with the book and ended with the book. Um, thank you to everybody for presenting and for coming. Yeah. This was really nice. Yeah.